Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 2, Why Study Cybersecurity? In this lesson, I'll sketch a definition of cybersecurity for you, and I'll make the case that cybersecurity is something that everybody can benefit from studying. It's rewarding for both casual computer users and technology enthusiasts alike. So what is cybersecurity exactly? One rough definition looks like this. Cybersecurity is protecting yourself and others from attacks that are carried out primarily with computers. Now, because the overwhelming majority of computer-based attacks are attacks on information, we may use the term cybersecurity interchangeably with the term information security. Cybersecurity is a rewarding study because no computer is secure, including yours. Every computer and every system has security vulnerabilities, including Wi-Fi networks, the servers that host your email accounts, your bank, every retailer that swipes your payment cards, and any computers that you might be holding or wearing right now. Even if nobody knows what those vulnerabilities are yet, be assured they exist. Now, maybe at first that perspective makes it sound like cybersecurity isn't worth studying at all. Why worry about a problem that I can't fix, you might ask. The answer is that you can still be more or less secure, and the more secure you are, the less of a target you are. Cyber criminals who are out to steal passwords or credit card numbers or whatever else, they're usually going to target less secure machines and less secure systems. I mean, think about it. Imagine that you're a bicycle thief and you find two similar bikes sitting on a bike rack, one with a lock and one without a lock. Which one would you be more likely to steal? The lockless one, right? Criminals are practical like that. They attack weaknesses. All other things being equal, the more weaknesses you cover, the lower the probability of a security breach. Now, you might be thinking that all this talk of computer weaknesses doesn't apply to you. You might be thinking, but I use a Mac or a Linux machine. I thought Mac and Linux machines were secure. But that's not really the case. Mac and Linux machines are just less popular. Why does popularity matter? Well, think like a criminal again for a minute. Imagine that you are a bicycle thief, and imagine that everybody in your city has bought a new lock for their bike. Now imagine that 9 out of every 10 cyclists has purchased lock A, and 1 out of every 10 has purchased lock B. Which kind of lock would you learn to pick? Well, you'd learn to pick lock A, right? Because there's many, many more opportunities to pick that lock. Now imagine that it's computers instead of bicycles. It turns out that there are about nine Windows computers for every Mac out there, assuming for now that we aren't including tablets and smartphones. And even fewer people run Linux machines. So for now, it's easier and more profitable for cyber criminals to focus their attacks on Windows PCs. But if the market were to even out so that Windows PCs didn't dominate like they do now, we would begin to see more attacks against Mac and Linux users as well. There is nothing inherently more secure about a Mac or a Linux computer, it's just easier for cyber criminals to focus their attacks on one kind of system, and it's more economical for them to attack the majority. But really, all this talk of attacking computers themselves is somewhat misleading. In reality, cyber criminals don't attack your computer at all. They attack you. We tend to think of cyber criminals as computer geniuses who use their technical mastery to hack into our systems, but most cyber criminals are more like con artists who exploit user behaviors rather than exploiting computer systems themselves. In many cyber attacks, the brand or type of computer that you're using is completely irrelevant because the criminal isn't attacking the computer, the criminal is trying to exploit you, the user. Now, a few cyber criminals out there probably are geniuses. But the truth is that most cyber attacks are carried out by regular criminals who have simply looked up how to attack a computer user. They're simply just following a set of directions. When these attacks work, they work because many computer users are naive. They don't understand how cyber criminals think, and they don't understand what kinds of cyber crimes are common or possible, and they don't really understand how the attacks are carried out. If you go online, you can find some lists of do's and don'ts for smart computer usage. Do's and don'ts are okay, but they don't really help you to understand why your computer is under attack or how those attacks are carried out. But we think that if you have a deeper understanding of cybersecurity, you'll be better prepared to recognize and avoid cyber attacks. And we also think that if you have a deeper understanding that goes beyond just simple do's and don'ts, 
then you'll be better prepared to teach yourself about new security problems when they arise. For this reason, we're going to go beyond do's and don'ts in this course and introduce themes like how computers work, how the internet works, how cyber criminals think, and what security tools are available to you. In this class, instead of just giving you a list of behaviors to blindly follow, we're going to help you to understand the issues surrounding cybersecurity so that you can take a more active role in your own digital defense. Finally, you might wonder whether this is going to be any fun. Well, our answer is yes. We think cybersecurity is loads of fun. Cybersecurity can feel like a great big strategy game, a game where everybody is a player, including computer users, security professionals, hackers, virus writers, con artists, corporations, banks, mobsters, armies, and nation states, all playing different roles and interacting with each other on different levels. Maybe it's the greatest, most complex strategy game in all of human history. And like it or not, you and your data are already in the game somehow. Okay, I hope that you're beginning to agree that cybersecurity is a valuable thing to study. In the next lesson, we're going to begin building your cybersecurity vocabulary by introducing some of the new language that we're going to be using in this course. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 3, Cybersecurity Terminology. In this lesson, I'm going to identify a few vocabulary terms that we use in cybersecurity, and I'm going to tell you a few stories that use those terms. We find that the best way to learn new words is to use them and to listen to other people using them. So that's what we're going to do here. Some of you may be watching this video as part of a course that uses this textbook. If you are, you should know that the vocabulary we're going to discuss in this video can all be found in chapter 1 of this book. Check out pages 6 through 11 especially. If you're not using this textbook, don't worry about it. Just follow along with the lesson. Here's a list of the vocabulary words that we're going to cover. Don't be intimidated here. We aren't asking you to memorize all of this just by watching this video. We find that the best way to learn new vocabulary is to encounter the words over and over again. Right now, we're just trying to provide some initial exposure to these words. Now, the first story I'm going to tell you is true. It's about a journalist named Matt Honan who was hacked by an anonymous cybercriminal. You can read about it in more depth at Wired.com. The story there is titled, How Apple and Amazon Security Flaws Led to My Epic Hacking. And this isn't a typo, by the way. He spells Matt with one T. Okay, I'm going to tell the story now. You should just follow along. Pay attention to the vocabulary words. As they come up, I'll highlight them for you. In August of 2012, hackers erased all of the data on Matt Honan's iPhone, iPad, and MacBook. Among the data lost were Honan's daughter's baby pictures and Honan's digital copies of old family photographs. The hackers also accessed Honan's Twitter account and tweeted a number of inflammatory, homophobic, and racist messages. They also deleted Honan's Google account, including eight years' worth of messages from his Gmail inbox. This attack compromised Honan's information on all three levels of the CIA model of information security. The hackers compromised the confidentiality of Honan's information when they accessed and viewed Honan's private, password-protected digital accounts. They compromised the integrity of Honan's information when they made unauthorized changes to it. These unauthorized changes included deleting his files and, in the case of his Twitter account, posting illegitimate messages. And of course, they compromised the availability of Honan's information. When the hackers changed Honan's passwords, he was locked out of his accounts, rendering his data temporarily unavailable. Even worse, when the hackers deleted Honan's data, they made it permanently unavailable. Or at least they attempted to do so. In the article on Wired.com, Honan expresses optimism that some of his information is recoverable. So, how did these hackers carry out this attack, which was both personally devastating and ultimately childish? Some of you may find this surprising, but these attacks were carried out without writing a single line of attack code. They required no special computer programs, nor did they require any particularly impressive technical skills. A script kitty, that is, a hacker with no significant programming knowledge, could have easily pulled off these attacks because the only tools necessary were a web browser, a telephone, 
and personal information about Honan that was available to anybody with an internet connection. If you want more details, you'll have to read the whole story on Wired.com, but I'll give you a summary of how the attack went down. Here it goes. The hackers began by collecting all of the personal information about Honan that they could collect from Honan's social media accounts and public records that were available online. They got Honan's email address, physical address, and other bits of information, and they used that information to crack Honan's Amazon account. How did they crack his Amazon account, you might ask? Well, it was surprisingly simple. The hackers called Amazon, pretended to be Honan, and asked the Amazon representatives to reset Honan's account for them. The hackers used Honan's personal information, along with the clever use of a fake credit card number, to convince Amazon's customer service that the hackers were really Matt Honan. With access to Honan's Amazon account, the hackers were able to collect even more personal information about him. Most significantly, Amazon gave them the last four digits of Honan's credit card number. They used this information to crack Honan's Apple ID, which gave them access to Honan's Apple devices. How did they crack his Apple ID, you might ask? They used the same basic trick as before. They called customer service at Apple and used Honan's personal information to convince them to reset his Apple ID password for them. Once they had access to his Apple ID, they had enough information and enough access to his accounts that they could run a password reset on his Google account. So they reset his Google password and logged into his Google account. They used his Google account to collect the information they needed to log into his Twitter account. And finally, they used his Twitter account to post offensive and embarrassing messages. To cover their tracks, the hackers deleted Honan's Google account, and they used his Apple ID to request a remote data wipe of his MacBook, iPhone, and iPad data. Ironically, this remote wipe service from Apple is intended to protect users from cybercriminals. It allows a user to remotely request that their data be deleted in the event that one's laptop, tablet, or phone are stolen. The hackers in this story took advantage of several security vulnerabilities. While some of these vulnerabilities were beyond Honan's control, one of the primary vulnerabilities was Honan's own fault. He had linked several of his online accounts together in such a way that access to one account could grant a hacker access to all of them. Honan admits that the attack would not have worked if he had taken care of the vulnerabilities that were under his control. Honan wrote an article about his experience for Wired.com. In the course of writing the article, he was able to make anonymous contact with one of the perpetrators, who explained the method that they had used to attack Honan's accounts. In cybersecurity terms, this method of attack is called an exploit. Once Honan knew this exploit, he and his peers at Wired.com tested to see if they could recreate the attacks in a controlled setting. They were successful several times, and if they had wanted to, they could have mounted malicious attacks of their own. Since then, Amazon and Apple have insisted that they have updated their customer identification protocols to eliminate the vulnerabilities on their end of the problem. So we can hope that these exploits are no longer effective. In his write-up of the story, Honan points out that as bad as the hack was, its impact could have been much worse. Had these hackers been cybercriminals who were driven by profit, they could, they could have easily used his email accounts to access his online banking information and ruin his finances. In a way, Honan was fortunate. If Honan's attacker wasn't driven by profit, what did drive him or her? Well, the hacker Honan exchanged messages with claimed that he was a hacker activist, a hacktivist and that his motivation was to spread awareness about computer security. He also claimed that he had help from another hacker, and he claimed that his helper was the one who was responsible for deleting Honan's data and his Google account. What do you think? This particular hacker claimed that he is really one of the good guys. Is he? Did he perform a valuable public service by hacking Honan's accounts? Okay. Now that we have an idea of how that attack went down, let's perform a little informal risk assessment. As you may have already read in the textbook, in the language of cybersecurity, risk is the combined measure of all the vulnerabilities, threats, and potential impact of cyber attacks for a given system. But what do these words mean exactly? If you already read the textbook, you might remember that vulnerability is a security term for describing potential weak points in a security system. 
threat is a security term for describing the likelihood of a given attack. Impact is a security term for describing the consequences of an attack. And as I said, risk is the combined measure of vulnerability, threat, and impact. So let's pretend for a moment that you use the same gadgets and accounts that Honan uses. And let's pretend that Apple and Amazon have not yet fixed the vulnerabilities on their end of the problem. If that were the case, how could you lower your security risks? Well, one way would be to reduce your vulnerability to attack. Honan points out that he would have decreased his vulnerability if he had enabled two-factor authentication on his Google account. Those of you who've used Gmail might be familiar with two-factor authentication. Every Google account is protected by at least one factor of authentication, a password. With Google, users have the option to require a second factor, a unique single-use code which is sent to your phone. Two-factor authentication dramatically reduces vulnerability. It's much tougher for a hacker to get your password and access your phone than it is for him to just get your password alone. Another way to reduce risk would be to reduce threat, or the likelihood, of an attack. Honan's threat of attack was naturally higher than yours probably is. He's a public figure who is known for writing online magazine articles about cybersecurity. These factors made him an enticing target for hackers. A relatively anonymous internet user like you or me is probably less likely to be targeted by hackers, at least by hackers who are interested in glory. As a rule of thumb, consider this. The more that people stand to gain from attacking you, the more likely you are to be attacked. This means that high reward targets faced increased threat, which translates into increased risk. Finally, we might reduce risk by reducing the potential impact of an attack. For example, Honan's attack would have been much lower impact if he had backed up his daughter's baby pictures on disks or on an external hard drive or on some other data storage device. If he had backups, he could have recovered more easily from his epic hacking experience. Well, good. I see that I was able to use most of the vocabulary words from pages 6 through 11 of the textbook in that epic hacking story. The only terms that I seem to have left out are nation-state, zero-day exploit, and malicious insider. I'll tell you another story, and I'll make sure to use those three terms in that story. I'll make this one shorter, though. The following story, a story about a cyber attack that was probably carried out by a nation state, is based on a profile that ran on CBS's 60 Minutes in 2012. The story goes like this. In June of 2010, a small security company in Belarus discovered a computer virus programmed to attack Siemens brand industrial control systems. An industrial control system is a computer that controls big industrial systems, such as a factory floor or a citywide electrical network. Industrial control systems are relatively small in size, but they do a lot of work. They direct most of the equipment in large facilities. Most factories, power plants, and other such facilities that you know of probably use some kind of industrial control system. This particular virus became known as Stuxnet. As security professionals analyzed Stuxnet, they made a surprising discovery. Though Stuxnet would infect many Siemens brand industrial control systems, it would only attack one of them. That's not to say that it would only attack one kind of Siemens system, mind you, but it would literally only attack one particular computer in the entire world. The only computer in the world that Stuxnet, Stuxnet was programmed to attack was the industrial control system at a particular uranium enrichment facility in Iran. Stuxnet infected many systems, but it would only attack this particular facility. The remarkably specific nature of Stuxnet, combined with its jaw-droppingly complex attack code, has led many pundits to speculate that no ordinary hacker is responsible for Stuxnet. Many people have reasoned that it must have been developed by a nation-state, most likely the United States or Israel, but maybe both. Of course, no government is taking responsibility for Stuxnet, and if it is indeed a government operation, then all records of it are top secret. What does Stuxnet do? Security professionals have determined that when Stuxnet found the right computer, 
it was programmed to make the computer accelerate the rate of rotation for some motorized centrifuges. That's equipment necessary for the enrichment of uranium. Stuxnet would also make the computer display incorrect data on the centrifuges so that the plant operators wouldn't see that anything was wrong. The overacceleration would damage the centrifuges, but the plant operators would attribute the damage to bad materials rather than to overacceleration. In order to write such specialized attack code, the Stuxnet programmers required intimate knowledge of the Iranian plant. A security expert interviewed in the 60 Minutes report claimed that the authors of Stuxnet probably knew the power plant better than the Iranian operators themselves. For this reason, some have speculated that a malicious insider may have leaked information about the plant to the programmers of Stuxnet. Did Stuxnet work? Nobody knows for sure, but it had a good chance because it was a zero-day exploit. That is, the attackers found the vulnerability before anybody else knew about it. Also, the plant that it was designed to attack did replace somewhere between 1 and 2,000 centrifuges. So, based on this circumstantial evidence, many security officials have concluded that Stuxnet probably caused the damage that it was designed to cause. That's all of the stories that I have for you for now. I hope that they have helped to familiarize you with some of those new security terms. If you have any trouble with learning the vocabulary in this class, the best advice I can give you is to just be patient. As long as you keep reading things that use this language, and as long as you look up the words that you don't understand, you will pick them up eventually. You just have to use them to learn them. In the next video, we're going to begin exploring the inner workings of a computer system. Now, we obviously cannot go into too much detail about such things. You could spend a whole lifetime studying computer science, so we'll keep things pretty basic. But if you understand some of the basics about how a computer works, you'll be better able to understand how cyber attacks work, and therefore you'll be better able to understand how to defend yourselves against them. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 4, Demystifying Computers, Part 1 of 2. As I'm sure you all know, technological advances have compressed more and more computing power into smaller and smaller packages. The desktop computers of yesterday are easily exceeded by the computing power of an average phone. Computers have become so compact and so seamless in appearance that it's becoming easier and easier to forget that they are complex systems composed of a variety of interacting parts. In this lesson, we're going to take apart a computer and examine how some of the bigger parts interact with each other. We're also going to begin examining how software interacts with computers. The goal isn't to make you an expert. I just hope to demystify computers for you a bit so that you're more comfortable talking about computer problems and better prepared to consider different ways to solve these problems. We might imagine four layers in a computer system. The user, the hardware, the operating system, and the applications. I'll discuss all four of these layers and describe how they interact. Layer one is the user, and that's easy enough to describe. The user is you. Well, you and anybody else who wants to accomplish some task with a computer. When you connect a computer to the internet, you connect to other computers, but you also potentially connect to countless other computer users. Most of these users are people who you want to connect with, friends, journalists, bankers, retailers, etc. But a few of them are cyber criminals of some kind, so keep that in mind. Layer 2 of the computer system is the hardware of the computer, its physical parts. We'll spend the bulk of this lecture describing hardware. We'll begin demystifying hardware by examining what we can see from the outside of the computer. Then we'll break open the computer and poke around at the hardware on the inside. To begin, let's consider a desktop system. We can see several different parts already. A monitor, a keyboard, a mouse, and a computer case, also known as a tower. Perhaps a printer is also lurking around somewhere nearby. The monitor, keyboard, mouse, and printer all need to communicate with the computer inside the tower, so they will usually be connected to the computer via cables. In some cases, these devices are able to connect wirelessly, either via Bluetooth connections or, especially in the case of printers, via a wireless internet router. 
but for the sake of keeping things obvious, we'll assume for now that these devices are networked together with cables. The devices that draw the most electricity, so the computer inside the tower, the monitor, and the printer, will all need a power cable. We didn't include power cables in this illustration, but you can imagine where they would go. Smaller devices, like the keyboard and the mouse, normally don't require a direct connection to a power outlet. The universal serial bus, or USB, connections that connect the keyboard and mouse to the computer are built to carry both data and electrical power, and so lower, low power devices like keyboards and mice normally route electricity from the computer tower. They just borrow power from the computer itself. In the case of wireless keyboards and wireless mice, they will be powered by batteries, of course. Now, the primary function of a monitor and a printer is to display information. We can think of information flowing from the computer into the monitor and printer, which display it for the user. Have you ever thought of a printer as a very slow, paper-based computer monitor? In some sense, that's what a printer is. The primary function of a keyboard and mouse is to input information and input commands into the computer. We can think of the information starting with the user and flowing into the computer via the keyboard and the mouse. Most desktop computers will also be connected to the internet. For now, let's assume that they use a physical ethernet cable rather than a wireless connection. Through this ethernet cable, the computer can communicate with the internet, sharing potentially huge amounts of information with the outside world. So this is what the whole system looks like from the outside. Electricity flows from a power outlet into the tower, and from the tower, some of the electricity is allocated to the keyboard and the mouse. Electricity also flows from an outlet to the monitor and from an outlet to the printer. The computer sends information from the tower to the monitor or printer, which allows the user to see it. The user inputs information and commands into the computer via the keyboard and the mouse. Finally, the computer is able to trade information with other computers via its internet connection. Now let's open up the tower and see what's inside that. We should find a large greenish plate fixed to one side of the tower. This plate is called a motherboard, and all the hardware inside the computer is connected together through this motherboard. We should also see a small fan fixed to the motherboard. This fan marks the presence of the central processing unit, or CPU, of the computer. This CPU processes information and executes a multitude of various instructions that the CPU receives from the software programs that are running on the computer. The overwhelming majority of actual computing that the computer does takes place here at the CPU. One helpful analogy is to think of the CPU as the brain that does the thinking in the computer. Though the CPU performs an astonishing number of computations in the blink of an eye, the CPU is a small device. It's just a small silicon chip. It's a lot smaller than the fan apparatus that covers it, and that's all you can see here in this picture. The fan helps to cool the CPU, maintaining it at an operable temperature. Near the CPU, we find small cards of random access memory, or RAM. RAM is the working memory inside a computer. If the CPU is doing all of the thinking, then the RAM provides content for the CPU to think about. Sometimes people will refer to RAM simply as memory. In computer language, the terms RAM and memory are informally interchangeable. If somebody asks how much memory is installed on a computer, they're probably referring to its RAM. And in these videos, I'm probably going to use the terms memory and RAM interchangeably. Near the front of the computer tower, where users normally insert disks and where the power button is normally located, we find two storage units in this, in this computer, the hard drive and the CD slash DVD drive. The hard drive contains a series of magnetic disks, together referred to as the hard disk, which can store a large amount of information. The hard disk can usually store tens or hundreds of times more information than can be held in the computer's RAM. For most computers, the hard disk is its primary storage unit containing both data files uh, such as user documents, music, and photos, and program files, so files that tell the CPU how to run different programs. But users don't have to store data in the computer's hard drive. Users can also store files and programs on removable media such as CDs and DVDs. 
files stored on CDs and DVDs are accessible via a computer's CD slash DVD drive. The advantage to keeping files and programs on removable disks is that they become easier to transport and they're also safe if the computer or hard drive happens to fail completely. The advantage to keeping files and programs on the computer's hard drive are that they should always be accessible whenever you have access to your computer and that they should load much faster from the hard drive than they would have from a CD or a DVD. Now, these days, people don't use CDs and DVDs nearly as much as they did, say, 10 years ago, but you still might see a CD slash DVD drive on a desktop computer. Sometimes people confuse a computer's memory with its storage, but we will be using those terms in different senses here. Memory, like I said, is the RAM. It's the information that the CPU has immediately available to it. Storage, on the other hand, is all of the information that the CPU has access to through drives like the hard drive or the CD slash DVD drive. There are other types of storage drives too, like say, flash drives. A CPU might have access to information that's in storage, but for the CPU to perform rapid and efficient operations with that information, the CPU must first load that stored information into its memory. To help illustrate the difference between computer memory and computer storage, I'm going to ask you to perform a little thought experiment. To start, close your eyes and picture your very first school teacher. Can you remember what he or she looks like? If you can't remember your first teacher, picture the earliest teacher that you can remember. Do you have somebody in mind? Now good, open your eyes if you haven't already opened them up. Now consider this. How long has it been since you thought about that person? Probably quite a long time, maybe even years. In any case, I bet you weren't thinking about him or her right before I asked you to. When the memory of that person was sitting dormant in your brain, that was kind of like computer storage, like you'd find on a hard drive. It's in there somewhere, but you aren't doing much with that information. It's just sitting there. When you recalled that memory to your mind, that was kind of like computer RAM. You accessed some information from storage, and you began operating with it, so you were conscious of it. The last piece of hardware I'm going to discuss in this lecture are input and output cards. A motherboard will normally contain a number of expansion slots for various input and output cards. For example, this motherboard has a slot for an Ethernet card, and in fact there is an Ethernet card plugged into that slot. The Ethernet card has a port for an Ethernet cable and this port will be exposed at the back of the computer tower so that the user can easily plug an ethernet cable into the computer. The computer connects to the internet through this ethernet card, and as you can imagine, the internet allows for both inputting information into the computer and outputting information from the computer. This computer also has a number of other slots for input and output cards, but in this image, those slots are empty. Other common expansion cards include graphics cards and sound cards. Graphics and sound cards will have some sort of audio or video ports, which will be exposed at the back of the computer for user access. Upgrading the graphics and sound cards can improve a computer's audiovisual outputs, and so such upgrades are popular among gamers and artists. Now, so far, we've been looking at the hardware on a desktop PC. I should point out that most notebooks, tablets, and smartphones have many of the same basic parts as a desktop. The main difference for these smaller devices is that the parts have been compressed and reconfigured to take up as little space as possible. A notebook computer is basically a desktop computer where the monitor, keyboard, and computer tower are all compressed into a package that's about the size of a notebook. Because a mouse doesn't really fit into a notebook, laptop manufacturers have replaced the mouse with onboard touchpad pointing devices. Tablets and smartphones come in even smaller packages, and they replace both the keyboard and the mouse with a touchscreen display. Tablets and smartphones also replace those boxy data storage devices from a desktop, like the hard drive and the CD and DVD drives, with internal flash-based storage. So that's the hardware of a computer. Now let's move on to the third layer of this computer system, the computer's operating system. The operating system is a large, complex program that runs on your computer. Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and Android are examples of well-known operating systems. If you have a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone, it probably runs one of those four. 
An operating system coordinates and facilitates the interactions between users, hardware, and software applications. Operating systems display the files that are available to the user. When the user commands the operating system to run a program or to open a data file, the operating system is responsible for accessing the appropriate file and coordinating its, coordinating its interactions with the computer's hardware. Pretty much every interaction that you have with a computer is mediated through the computer's operating system. The fourth and final layer that we're going to discuss in this lecture is the layer of computer applications. Applications are programs that are designed to perform specific tasks for the user. For example, most operating systems come with a calculator application that's pre-installed. Your web browser, such as Firefox, Chrome, or Safari, is another example of an application. The operating system displays which applications, which applications are available to the user, and when the user selects an application, the operating system opens the application and coordinates its interactions with the computer's hardware. Applications are normally stored on the hard disk of a computer, though it's possible to store them in other places as well, perhaps on a CD or DVD, or on a thumb drive. Okay, in this lesson, I introduced you to four layers in a computer system. The users, the hardware, the operating system, and the applications. That will be all for now on demystifying computers. In part two of this lesson, we will continue to demystify computers by discussing what happens when you turn a computer on and when you run an application. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is lesson five, Demystifying Computers, part two of two. In the last lecture, I tried to demystify computers a little bit by identifying and examining four layers in a computer system, the user, the hardware, the operating system, and the applications. In this lecture, I hope to illustrate and to clarify how these layers interact with each other by examining what happens when you turn a computer on and what happens when you run an application. In this lesson, I'm going to walk you through a couple of illustrations out of this textbook, which some of you may be using in a class that assigns these videos. But don't worry if you aren't using the textbook, just follow along with the video. We'll start with this illustration, which diagrams what happens when we turn on a computer. When we press the power button on a computer, the computer's power supply begins to distribute current to the different parts of the computer so that they can operate. When the CPU receives current from the power supply, the CPU searches for a special program that helps to load the operating system into the computer. For PCs, this program is called the Basic Input-Output System, or BIOS. As you can see, in this diagram, it's labeled BIOS. Now, as you may remember from the last lesson, most of the program files on your computer are stored on a hard disk. However, the BIOS is a special program hardwired into the motherboard itself. What does it do? Well, the BIOS grants the CPU access to all of the hardware components that are connected to the motherboard, and it helps the CPU to access the computer's startup code, which is called boot code. Most computers store boot code in the hard disk, but it's also possible to configure a computer to boot from another storage device, such as a CD or a USB flash drive. The boot code is loaded from the computer storage into its RAM, and the CPU runs the boot code from the RAM. The boot code tells the computer to load the operating system into the computer's memory, and so the computer loads the operating system. Like the boot code, the operating system is normally stored on a computer's hard drive, but it's possible to store an operating system on some other storage device, such as a CD or a USB device. Wherever the operating system is, the computer will load it into RAM so that the CPU can run it. Once the operating system is loaded, it will automatically tell the CPU to run a number of automatic startup applications, such as device drivers, firewalls, antivirus software, the computer's clock and calendar, and other applications that run in the background on the computer. Much like the boot code and the operating system, these automatic startup applications are stored on a storage device, and they must be loaded into RAM before the CPU can run them. Once those automatic startup applications are up and running, the user may begin to interact with the computer via the mouse and keyboard. If you have a username and password set up on your computer, this is the point where you'd be prompted to enter it. 
So that's what happens when you switch on a computer. Now let's take a look at what happens when you load and run an application. For this, let's look at a different illustration. This illustration shows what happens when you load an application onto your computer. I already said that the operating system will run a number of applications automatically, but many applications are configured to only run when the user commands the operating system to run that application. For example, your computer usually won't run a web browser unless you tell the computer to open the web browser. This curvy red arrow represents a user entering the command to run a program, say by double clicking on the program with the computer's mouse. This command is processed by the operating system, which is running on the computer's memory. The operating system then accesses the program file from a storage device. Let's imagine that the program that the user wanted to open is a web browser. The web browser file loads into the computer's memory and the web browser runs from there. The web browser will normally display something for the user to see on the computer monitor and the user can usually input information and commands into the application through the keyboard and the mouse. For example, users can navigate to web pages by typing a web address into the browser's address bar, and they might interact with web pages by clicking on different parts of the page with the mouse pointer. And here's something more that you should know. As we have seen, applications run through your computer's operating system. That means that anytime you're running an application, it can potentially access anything that the operating system can access. Because the operating system has access to every file and every piece of hardware connected to your computer, every application on your computer may also potentially access any file or any piece of hardware on your computer. So in principle, an active application can access everything in your computer system, even if the user isn't aware of it. This means that it's possible to write applications that use your own computer against you. For example, it would be possible to write an application that records all of the keystrokes that a user punches into their keyboard, and then secretly uses an internet connection to send that keystroke information to some third party. And then that third party could mine your keystrokes for sensitive information, like usernames and passwords or bank account numbers. In fact, many such applications already exist. They are called key logging programs, and cybercriminals would be delighted to install one on your computer. Okay, that's all for now on these two illustrations. Obviously, there is much more to learn. I just wanted to give you an overview so that you could get an idea of how your computer system is tied together. Understanding how the different parts of the system are connected together should eventually help you to understand what kinds of weaknesses the bad guys like to attack. In the next video, we're going to continue laying the groundwork for basic understanding of computer science. And remember, we're doing this so that you'll be better prepared to understand how cyber criminals use the wonders of computing against you. These past couple lessons, we've been discussing individual computers, but now we're going to move on to a vast network of computers that are all connected together, and that is the internet. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 6, Demystifying the Internet, Part 1 of 3. What is the Internet, really, and how does it work? Addressing these questions now will help you to understand some of the security vulnerabilities that we will discuss in later lessons. To begin, imagine for a moment that you live in a world with computers, but without the Internet. Imagine that you are, say, a physicist, and imagine that you use your laboratory computer to collect and store data from your physics experiments. Now imagine that several of your co-workers, fellow physicists and lab assistants, require access to your data as well. Now, one way to grant your co-workers access to this data is to let them use your computer. Sharing computers is nice as far as it goes, but it has some obvious limitations. For example, what could happen if everybody needed to use the computer at the same time? Because it's not always practical to share computers, you and your coworkers would probably look for some way to share the data itself instead. You could copy the data onto disks or flash drives and walk it over to your coworkers' workstations, but that too would have some obvious limitations, especially if some of your coworkers' workstations were on another floor of your building, 
or maybe even in a different building altogether. Another way to share data would be to network your computers together, allowing them to share data directly. Such a method could allow thousands of users to share huge stores of information almost immediately across a large number of individual workstations. Indeed, this is what countless organizations have chosen to do. Most companies and large organizations have some kind of computer network. An organization with a computer network enjoys many advantages over an organization with unconnected computers. For example, networked computers make it easier to access, distribute, and back up important information. They can provide users the flexibility to log into their workstation or into their network account from multiple locations. And networks allow users to connect individual workstations to some kind of central work hub, such as a printer and copy center or a conference room. So now let's imagine that you and your physicist coworkers have developed a computer network that allows you to share important data with users across your organization. Furthermore, let's imagine that another group of physicists on the other side of town also works on their own network of computers. It's easy to imagine that these two groups of physicists would know each other and they might naturally be interested in each other's research. So maybe they would get together, and maybe they would decide that it would be mutually beneficial if they could join their networks together into one big data sharing network. When multiple networks join together like this into a network of networks, that is called internetworking. The internet is one giant piece of internetworking. It's a network of many computer networks all internetworked together. The internet is not the only example of internetworking, but it's the biggest example in the world, and as you know, it's the one that you are most likely to interact with on a daily basis. When you begin to network large numbers of computers together, you need increasingly complex systems of cables and data transfer devices to keep this network connected together. When these networks connect diverse people, organizations, and business interests over a large geographic area, a few important questions naturally arise. One is, who owns the networking devices that make the internet possible, and who is responsible for fixing them when they break? The short answer is that organizations called Internet Service Providers, or ISPs, own and maintain the physical networking cables and networking devices that facilitate the internet. And who are the Internet Service Providers, you might ask? They are mostly big private companies, such as Time Warner or Comcast, while some others are government agencies. Another question that's useful to answer is this. How do computers communicate across the network? For computers to communicate with each other, they need a well-defined set of communication rules. That's because computer messages have precise, unambiguous meaning. We humans are used to dealing with ambiguity. If we hear an ambiguous sentence from another human, we can ask for clarification, or we might make an educated guess at what the person meant to say. But computers don't work this way. Computers need precise, unchanging, and unambiguous rules in order to communicate well with each other. Any strict, fixed set of communications rules is called a communications protocol. In order to network computers together, the computers on the network must share a common protocol. And as you could probably guess, in order to internetwork multiple networks together, these networks must also agree on a common internetworking protocol. Every device that is networked together on the internet uses a particular protocol called Internet Protocol, which is usually abbreviated IP. One of the features of Internet Protocol, which will come up later in this course, is that Internet Protocol requires a unique address, called an IP address, for every device that is connected to the internet. All of the web pages, files, and software that is accessible on the internet has to be stored on some kind of device that's connected to the network. Every time one device requests a file from another device on the internet, it needs to specify where the file is stored. Now, IP addresses allow devices to do that. And whenever that data request is fulfilled, the device providing the data needs to know which other device it's supposed to deliver the data to. Again, IP addresses allow devices to do that. Running the internet without IP addresses would be a little like running the postal service without mailing addresses. So, in summary, the internet is a vast network of other networks all networked together. Internet service providers, or ISPs, are the organizations that own the cables and networking devices that the internet runs on. Computers need strict sets of communication rules, called protocols, in order to communicate with each other. 
and the communications protocol of the internet is called internet protocol or IP. Finally, every device on the internet gets its own IP address. That's all for now, and the next lesson we'll discuss how the internet is structured and how IP addresses get assigned to all those devices on the internet. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 7, Demystifying the Internet, Part 2 of 3. In this lesson, we will examine some illustrations that will help us to see the internet in greater detail. Some of you may be watching this video as part of a course that uses this textbook. If you are, you should know that the illustrations in this video are from Chapter 2 of the book. If you aren't using this book, don't worry about it, just follow along with the video. This first illustration models the mysterious cloud view of the internet. Casual users see information go into and come out of the internet, and they understand what kinds of information and services are available. Email services, web pages, online retailers, banking institutions, and more. But they may not understand how that information is networked together. Let's take a closer look at the structure of the internet so that the cloud is not so mysterious. This next illustration begins to show how the internet is networked together in a little more detail. It shows how the internet is arranged loosely into a hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy is what is referred to as the backbone of the internet. The backbone of the internet consists of the largest set of internet service providers, or ISPs as they're called. An ISP is an organization that owns, controls, and maintains a large number of the computer networking cables and networking devices that make the internet possible. These largest ISPs include corporations, governments, and in some cases large academic organizations. The connections linking the biggest ISPs together are modeled by red arrows in this illustration. These arrows represent the network cables that carry the most information. Most internet traffic must travel through one of these backbone connections at some point as it travels across the net. As we work our way down the hierarchy, we see that there is a tier of medium-sized ISPs. These medium-sized ISPs are responsible for considerably less internet traffic and considerably fewer cables and networking devices than the backbone ISPs are. But they are still responsible for a huge amount of traffic. In this illustration, the blue arrows represent the internet traffic between these medium ISPs and the backbone ISPs above them. The green arrows represent the connection between the medium ISPs and an organization further down the hierarchy. As we can see in the illustration, a business with its own private internal network might connect its many users directly to one of these blue medium-sized ISPs. However, a residential user might connect to the medium ISPs through an even smaller local ISP. These small local ISPs that connect residents to the internet are often controlled by a local cable company or a local phone company. The connection between the smallest tier of ISPs and an individual residence is represented here by a purple arrow. The connection represented by the purple arrow might carry a lot of information, streaming video, file downloads, or maybe online games. But that quantity of information is just nothing compared to the quantity represented by the arrows higher up on the hierarchy. So there it is. This illustration shows us how internet service providers are organized into a hierarchy, with the ISPs on the top handling the most data, and the ISPs and residents on the bottom handling the least data. This next illustration shows something else. As you may already know, every device that is connected to the internet has a unique address called an IP address. This illustration shows a couple different ways that IP addresses get assigned to devices. This diagram includes three fictional networks, the XYZ Office Network, the ABC Office Network, and the Joe's Coffee Shop Network. To keep the diagram relatively simple, the rest of the internet has been condensed down into a cloud in the middle of the illustration. First, let's take a look at the XYZ Office Network on the left side of the illustration. Those red numbers are the IP addresses for the whole network. Every IP address is numerical like that. They are always written as four sets of digits, each separated by a period. Each of these four sets of digits can be any number from 0 to 255. So take a look at the IP address of the XYZ network. It's 197.12.15.2.
all of the devices connected to the XYZ network will be assigned IP addresses that begin with the first three sets of digits, 197.12.15. Device IP addresses ending in 0 are restricted, and device IP addresses ending in 255 are also reserved, so in practice, the range of possible IP addresses for devices on this network are 0.1 to 0.254. As we can see in the illustration, the router at the XYZ office network has been assigned the IP address ending in .254. Meanwhile, Carol's desktop computer has been assigned the IP address ending in .10. There are 252 IP addresses remaining in the available range for this network. The XYZ office network uses static IP address assignments. Static IP addresses are unchanging. That means that for the foreseeable future, Carol's desktop has been permanently assigned this particular IP address. 197.12.15.10 is permanently reserved for her computer. The opposite of static IP address assignment is dynamic IP address assignment. For an example of dynamic IP address assignment, let's take a look at the ABC office network over on the right side of the illustration. The ABC office network is at the IP address 207.10.2.0. Just like in the case of the XYZ office network, devices connecting to the network can use any IP address starting with those first three numbers and ending with any number from 1 to 254. For example, on this network, the router took the IP address ending in 254, Bob's computer took the address ending in 15, and Alice's computer took the address ending in 5. But unlike the XYZ network, the ABC office network uses dynamic IP addresses instead of static IP addresses. This means that some of these IP addresses are subject to change. You see, the ABC office network has a special piece of hardware called a Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol Server, or a DHCP server, as it's often abbreviated. The Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol Server assigns a device one of the 254 possible network IP addresses each time a device begins a new internet session. The DHCP server will lease each IP address for a set period of time, and after that time passes, then the device will have to renew its lease. I know that I'm throwing a lot of new information at you, but I promise that the underlying concept isn't very difficult. All we're saying is that, for example, Bob's computer has the IP address ending in 0.15 for now, but it might be assigned a new IP address once the hour is up. What are the advantages and disadvantages of dynamic IP addresses versus static IP addresses? Well, the advantage of a static IP address, like Carol has on her computer, is that her IP address is always available to her. She has a reserved place on the router. When IP addresses are assigned dynamically, as they are for Bob's computer over here, then there's a chance that there won't be any room for him when he tries to connect to the network. If the DHCP server has already assigned all the IP addresses available to it, then there won't be any left for Bob. The advantage of dynamic IP address assignment is that dynamic assignments are more flexible. Thousands of different devices could connect to the ABC network, and as long as they don't all try to connect at the same time, the DHCP server can assign them all an IP address on the network. Let's look down at the bottom of this illustration to see one more network configuration that also uses dynamic IP address assignments. Joe's Coffee Shop Network is at IP address 207.10.3.0. This means that devices connected to it can take the IP addresses beginning with those three numbers and ending with a number between 1 and 254. Over the course of, say, a month, a coffee shop could probably expect to have many more than just 254 devices connect to their wireless connection. But at any given time throughout the day, they would probably have only a few devices connected. Uh, maybe 50 or so. This is a perfect situation for dynamic IP address assignments. The network only has 254 IP addresses that it can assign, but it can easily accommodate all of its users by assigning these addresses on a temporary basis only to the users who are active on the network. But remember, when we were examining the ABC office network connection, we saw that a network needs a dynamic host configuration protocol server in order to accommodate dynamic IP addressing. Where is the DHCP server at Joe's Coffee Shop? The answer is that at Joe's Coffee Shop, the DHCP server is combined with the internet router. Instead of the router and the DHCP server being two separate devices, they're integrated together into a single device. 
This is pretty common. Most home internet routers also have DHCP servers built into them, and so most home networks can accommodate dynamic IP address assignments. So what are the big takeaways from this illustration? I want you to see that a computer's IP address usually depends on a router's IP address. I also want you to see that your device's IP address can change depending on what network it's on and depending on whether the network uses dynamic or static IP address assignment. Finally, I want you to note the structure of an IP address, that it's four numbers separated by periods. The last illustration that we will examine in this lecture models the difference between a public IP address and a private IP address. In our discussion of IP addresses so far, we have not been making the distinction between public and private IP addresses. I've been speaking as if all IP addresses are the same, but there is a significant difference between public IP addresses and private IP addresses. This illustration shows two different networks that are connected to the internet, Alice's home network and Bob's home network. Alice's home network is composed of two devices, a router and Alice's computer. Bob's home network is composed of four devices, a router, Bob's computer, Carol's computer, and a printer. Let's take a look at Bob's home network on the right side of this illustration. Bob's local internet service provider has only assigned him one IP address, but he would like to connect two computers to the internet, his and Carol's, and furthermore, he'd like to connect his wireless printer to his home network. The rules of IP require that every device has its own IP address, but Bob's internet service provider has only given him one IP address to work with. So what does Bob do? He will use his router to create a private home network to connect his four devices together. And then he'll connect his entire home network to the public internet through the IP address that his internet service provider has assigned him. From the perspective of somebody outside on the public internet, Bob appears to have only one device connected to the internet, and that's his router. But Bob's router can coordinate Bob's public internet connection with multiple devices on his private network. So from within the private network, we can see that there are really three more devices connected to the public internet through Bob's router. Now let's compare Bob's home network to Alice's home network on the bottom left portion of the illustration. Both networks have a public IP address, and those public IP addresses are unique. Indeed, every public IP address must be unique. However, Bob's and Alice's routers help them to create private networks, and these private networks can reuse the same IP addresses. For example, we can see that Alice's computer's private IP address is identical to Bob's computer's private IP address. This repetition is possible because of the distinction between their private IP addresses and their public IP addresses. It's kind of like how every apartment building in a city must have a unique street address for the post office to deliver mail to. But at each unique street address, the apartment buildings can reuse the same apartment numbers. Okay, I know that we've covered a lot of ground here with these illustrations, so let's take a break. In the next video, we'll examine a few more illustrations that will help us to see how information is routed through the internet. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 8, Demystifying the Internet, Part 3 of 3. In this lecture, we will examine a few illustrations that help us to see how information travels through the many twists and turns of the internet. When you use the internet, what you're doing is using your computer to send information or requests for information to other computers. These computers that store and deliver information are examples of networking computers called servers. Here's an image of a technician who's examining a large network server. When you send an email, you're telling your computer to send a message to be stored on a mail server. When you read your own email, you're asking your computer to access messages that have been stored for you on a server. When you view a web page, you're using your computer to display a web document that somebody else uploaded to a web server. When you download media files from internet stores like iTunes, Amazon, or Google Play, information is copied from a server to your computer. Not quite all internet content is on servers, though. Peer-to-peer -peer sharing software allows users to download files directly from each other's internet-connected personal computers rather than from a large central server. 
In either case, internet activity is the activity of machines sending information and information requests to each other. As we learned in previous lessons, every machine connected to the internet is affiliated with a unique IP address. When machines send information and information requests to each other, they send them to these IP addresses. And as we've seen in previous lessons, IP addresses are long strings of numbers. Computers have no trouble working with long, apparently random strings of numbers. But as you can imagine, we humans have trouble reading and remembering long strings of numbers like that. Think about it. How many IP addresses can you name from memory? I would guess that the answer is zero. And yet you probably request information from servers at various IP addresses every single day. So how do we use the internet without knowing the IP addresses of various servers? The answer is that we assign natural human language names to places on the internet. These natural names are called domain names. Both email addresses and web addresses are common examples of domain names. When you submit either an email address or a web address, your computer has to translate those domain names into numerical IP addresses. So when you punch in a web address, an email address, or any other domain name, how does your computer figure out what numerical IP address it should look for? The answer is that your computer must access a domain name service server, or DNS server for short. I'm going to show you what that looks like. I'm going to use a couple illustrations from this textbook. Some of you may be taking a formal course that uses this textbook, but if you're not, that's okay. Just follow along with the video. This illustration helps us to see how domain name services work. In this illustration, Bob wants to visit www.dougj.net. When Bob submits the URL www.dougj.net into the address bar on his browser, his computer accesses a system called the Domain Name Service, or DNS. Internet-capable computers have an application on board that allows them to access this domain name service. Bob's computer will send a request to the DNS server at his local internet provider. This request asks the DNS server, hey, what's the IP address for DougJ.net? Sometimes the local server already knows the answer and so it can simply answer the question right away. However, the local DNS server may not know the answer, and in that case, the request gets sent further up the server tree to a higher level DNS server, and the question gets repeated. If the question isn't answered, it gets sent even further up the tree to a root server. A root server is responsible for a tremendous number of domain names. For example, a root server might be responsible for all domain names that end in .com, or all domain names that end in .net. The root server must either know the IP address for all of these domains, or at least it must know where to find these IP addresses. If the root server doesn't know the IP address for DougJ.net, it knows how to route the request so that it makes it to a server that does know. The root server might send the request back down the tree to a different lower level DNS server, which might eventually send the request to the local DNS server for DougJ.net. If this domain name exists, then the local DNS server will definitely know its IP address. In this case, the requested IP address is 129.186.105.24. The IP address gets sent back through the network of DNS servers. And eventually, it makes it back to Bob's computer. Once Bob's computer knows the proper numerical IP address, it can make an information request from the machine storing the web page data. Bob's computer might now store the IP address for later use. Although it takes a while to explain the process of accessing an IP address from a DNS server, the computers involved carry out this operation so rapidly that we normally don't even realize that anything has happened. Okay, that's how DNS servers help coordinate IP addresses. Now let's look at another common networking device, routers. Throughout this introduction to the internet, I have mentioned machines called routers, and I have referred to some information being routed across the web. But with all of the millions of devices connected to the internet, how exactly do routers direct traffic to the right IP addresses? Well, let me show you. This next illustration helps us to see how information is routed. In this illustration, we have two networks, network one and network two. You might notice that router one is connected to both networks, and so it has two different IP addresses. When you're looking at router one as a member of network one, then its IP address is 192, 0.168.1.1. But when you're looking at router 1 as a member of network 2, then its IP address is 207.20.15.1. .1. 
So those two IP addresses don't refer to different devices, they just refer to the same device from different perspectives on different networks. Network 1 consists of three devices, Alice's computer, Bob's computer, and Router 1. Network 2 also consists of three devices, Carol's computer, Router 1, and Router 2. Notice that Network 1 has no direct connection to the internet. Network 1 can only connect to the internet through Network 2. Every device on a computer network has something called a route table. A route table contains instructions for routing information to a given IP address. To keep the clutter down, we have only included three of these route tables in the picture. The one for Alice's computer, the one for router 1, and the one for Carol's computer. But the other computers and routers would also have their own route tables too. Let's look at Alice's route table first. Alice's route table has two columns, the destination column and the next hop column. When Alice's computer wants to send information to an IP address in the destination column, it follows the directions in the next hop column. The first row on her route table tells us that information going to any IP address on network 1 will be sent directly to that IP address. For example, Alice's computer can send information directly to Bob's computer. These computers are networked together directly, so there's no need to relay the information through another network. But what happens if Alice's computer tries to send information to any other IP address, one that's not listed on the route table? For IP addresses not listed on the route table, Alice's computer will send information to the default next hop, which in this case turns out to be router1. Once router1 receives the information, it will run the destination IP address through its own route table. So let's take a look at the route table for router1. If information is destined for any IP address on network1 or network2, then router1 will send this information directly to that IP address. It can do that because it's connected directly to both of those networks. If the information is destined for any IP address outside of these two networks, then router1 will default to sending the information to router2. From router2, this information would continue on through the internet, most likely to be directed by several more route tables before reaching its final destination. So if Alice wanted to send information to Bob's IP address, then Alice's route table would direct that information directly to Bob's computer. If Alice wanted to send information to Carol's computer, then the route table on her computer would direct that information to router1, and then the route table on router1 would direct that information to Carol's computer. If Alice wanted to access a web page somewhere else on the internet, then the route table on her computer would direct that information to router1, the route table for router1 would direct that information to router2, and then so on throughout the internet until Alice's web page request re reached the appropriate server somewhere on the internet. Now let's trace a couple of routes from Carol's computer. If Carol wanted to send information from her computer to Bob's computer, then her route table would direct that information to router1, and then the route table at router1 would direct that information to Bob's computer. If Carol wanted to send information to an IP address that is on neither network1 or network2, then her route table would default to sending that information to router2, which would then run through its route table to direct that information to the next address in line. In this illustration, we've simplified the route tables so that they're easier to understand. Real route tables have more lines of instructions than the route tables in this illustration, I hope that you can see how complex networks can run on relatively short route tables. Indeed, the route table on your computer is probably much less than a page long, and yet it allows you to connect to potentially billions of IP addresses. Now, so far, we've examined how computers use domain name service or DNS servers to translate domain names that are easy for people to read into IP addresses that are easy for computers to read. We've also examined how computers and routers use route tables to route information through networks. Now we're going to examine one last illustration that will help you to see how computers access web pages. Web pages are special documents that are stored on high capacity computers called web servers. When you access a web page on your computer, you send an information request to the IP address of a server, and the server sends that information back to the IP address of your computer. Your computer's web browser allows your computer to display the web page. Web pages are highly flexible documents. They can display text, images, audio, video, and interactive programs like games. But what makes web pages really special is their ability to link to other web pages. That's why we call them web pages. They're connected together like a web. 
As you can see in the illustration, when Bob accesses www.dougj.net, his computer accesses the web server that hosts that website. The website, dougj.net, consists of a cluster of files that are stored on that computer. Each file contains all or part of a web page, which Bob can view in his web browser. The first page that comes up when Bob navigates to dougj.net will be the home page. Because of the interconnected nature of the web, this home page can link to several other web pages. Furthermore, any of these web pages could link to any other page on the web. So a link at dougj.net could make Bob's computer request the home page for www.anothersite.net. And then Bob might begin exploring the various web pages associated with anothersite.net. In all probability, the web document files for anothersite.net would be located on a completely different server than the files associated with dougj.net. Indeed, these servers could be on opposite sides of the globe. But if Bob has a good internet connection, he can browse through those web documents stored on servers thousands of miles apart more quickly than he could browse through a book on the other side of his office. This is all thanks to the lightning quickness of electric signals and the shrewd networking techniques that we've been describing in these lessons. Okay, that's all for now on the internet. I hope that it's a little less mysterious now than it was before. Now, this course isn't intended to make you a networking wizard, but we hope that if you have a clearer mental picture of what the internet is and how it works, then you'll be better prepared to understand how the internet plays into different security issues. In the next lesson, we're going to begin learning about passwords, which are very important for cybersecurity. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 9, Passwords and Hash Functions. In this lecture, we're going to talk about passwords, and we'll begin talking about how hash functions help to keep passwords secure. We'll start with a short story. Passwords are nothing new. For example, there's a story in the Bible that's over 2,000 years old where two groups of people are at war, the Gileadites and the Ephraimites. According to the story, during the war, the Gileadites captured an important river crossing on the Jordan River. They didn't want their enemies, the Ephraimites, to have free passage across the river, but they also couldn't tell who was and was not an enemy just by looking at them. Every once in a while, an Ephraimite would pretend to be a Gileadite and try to use the river crossing. But there were Gileadite guards who stayed at the river crossing and asked everybody who wanted to cross to pronounce the Hebrew word shibboleth. It turned out that the Ephraimites had grown up pronouncing that word differently. So instead of saying shibboleth, they would say sibboleth. When that happened, the Gileadite guard would execute the Ephraimite. So passwords are nothing new, but they're probably more common today than they ever have been before in the past. Think about it. How many password-protected accounts and devices do you have? Pause the video for a moment and try to count them up. Unpause it whenever you're ready. Did you count them? Good. How many password-protected accounts and devices do you have? I wouldn't be surprised at all if you had 20 or more. And in all likelihood, there are probably a few more that you forgot about while you were counting. That's a lot of passwords to remember. Ideally, these passwords keep your information secure. Computers can't keep your information secure unless they can limit access to particular people. But they can't check your photo ID, or scan your retina, or read your DNA. So passwords are the preferred means of proving that you are who you say you are. And really, passwords are much simpler and more convenient than trying to use photo IDs or retina scans or DNA evidence to prove your identity. Of course, for a password to be useful, both you and the service that you're logging into have to have a copy of it. Let's say you want to log into an online banking account. When you log into your online account, you normally submit a username and password. The bank will check your username and passwords against a list of usernames and passwords in one of its servers. If the username and password that you have submitted matches the one stored on the server, then they let you in. 
as you can imagine, those servers full of password files are tempting targets for cyber criminals. Imagine just one hack that could provide access to thousands of bank accounts or millions of email accounts. To help keep passwords secure, companies like your bank use a special mathematical function called a hash function to encrypt passwords before storing them on their servers. A hash function converts a string of letters, numbers, and symbols into a completely different string called a hash value. As you can see from this illustration, a hash value looks nothing like the original password. It uses completely different symbols, and it converts passwords of all lengths into one standard length, so that the length of the hash value can't be used to guess the length of the original password. Even similar looking passwords will result in completely different looking hash values. In this example, we just added the number one to the end of Alice's password, but the resulting hash value is completely different. Even if a hacker breaks into the password files at your bank and steals the hashed passwords, and even if they know the mathematical formula for the hash function, hash values are of little use to them because the hacker can't translate the hash values back into the passwords. The hash function only works one way. It can only scramble the passwords, not descramble them. So hash functions are, for all practical purposes, irreversible, even for people who understand how the function works. The person who originally wrote the hash function would be just as unable to reverse it as any hacker would be. That might seem a little counterintuitive at first. How can a mathematical function only go one way? To show you how a function could be irreversible, I'm going to refer to some mathematical terms. If you have a little trouble following along, don't sweat it. You won't be quizzed on the math parts of this lecture, at least not by me. I'm just including some math because I think many of you will find it interesting, and also because I think a mathematical illustration can help to make sense of the counterintuitive idea that a hash function could be totally irreversible. First, let's consider two prime numbers. You're going to time yourself as you multiply them together. For this example, let's use 13 and 41. In a moment, I'd like you to pause the video, and I'd like you to check how long it takes you to multiply these two numbers together. Ideally, you should use pencil and paper for this exercise, but you can use a calculator if you want to. Time yourself to see how long it takes to finish the problem. After you find the solution, unpause the video and continue on. Are you ready to pause? Good. Pause it now. Are you finished? About how long did it take to multiply the numbers together? Make sure you write that time down. Now the answer that you should have gotten is 533. I suspect that it didn't take you very long to find that answer, especially if you were using a calculator. Now let's do a similar problem, but let's do it in reverse. This time, let's consider the number 3,127. 3,127 is the product of two prime numbers, just like how 533 is the product of 13 and 41. Can you figure out which two prime numbers multiplied together produce 3,127? I'll even give you another hint. Both prime numbers are two digits long. Okay, got that? Pause the video now and try to calculate which two prime numbers multiplied together equal 3,127. If you get stuck, just unpause the video and move on. Don't worry about it. Ready? Good. Pause the video now. Did you figure it out? Don't feel bad if you didn't. This was supposed to be a difficult problem. The numbers you were looking for were 53 and 59. What this illustration shows is that some mathematical functions are much easier to figure out forwards than they are backwards. It's much easier to multiply two prime numbers together than to find the prime factors of a large number. Even computers struggle to find prime factors when the numbers involved are big enough. Hash functions are the same way. It's relatively easy to turn a password into a hash, but there's no known way to reverse a hash function. Okay, that's all for now on passwords and hash functions. As we've just seen, your passwords are usually pretty safe when they're kept on servers. That's because the people who put passwords onto servers use hash functions to scramble them. But cybercriminals will also use a variety of other tactics to steal your usernames and your passwords. 
In the next video, we will discuss several of those tricks and develop some strategies for avoiding them. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 10, Common Password Threats. In the last lesson, I introduced passwords, and I explained how businesses use encryption formulas called hash functions to help keep your passwords a secret. It would be nice if that were the final word on the matter. That is, if hash functions would ensure that passwords would remain secure always and forever. But of course, that's not the world we live in. In the real world, our passwords remain vulnerable. In this lecture, I'll introduce you to 10 common threats to your passwords. User disclosure, social engineering, phishing, key logging, wireless sniffing, brute force guessing, dictionary attacks, unencrypted password files, exposed passwords with known hash values, and security questions. Throughout this video, I'll suggest ways in which you can minimize these threats. As you will see, it's important to have a strong password, but it's even more important to handle your password wisely. Password threat one is user disclosure. Now this might seem obvious, but you shouldn't tell other people your passwords. You can never tell for certain who is and who is not trustworthy. You might respond, oh, I trust this person. I know that she's not a cyber criminal and there's a good chance that you're right. However, are you sure that you trust all of the people that this other person trusts? What if she discloses your password to a criminal somehow? And even if you don't believe that this trusted person would intentionally disclose your password, are you really sure that she wouldn't do so accidentally? If you let your mind wander for a moment, it's easy to think of dozens of scenarios in which a trusted person could accidentally lose or disclose your private password. The bottom line is that as soon as you share your password, you lose control over how that password is shared by others. Why take such an unnecessary risk? Just keep them to yourself. You should especially avoid emailing or messaging your password to other people. Even if you trust the recipient with your life, you can't guarantee that somebody else isn't reading their emails or won't read them sometime in the future. You should also avoid writing your password down in obvious places. If you do have to write a password down, don't keep it near your computer. And for goodness sake, don't keep a list of passwords on your computer under the file name passwords. Avoid keeping your passwords on a computer file altogether unless you're using a trusted password management software. If you keep a handwritten list of passwords, Keep that list somewhere secret and safe. Remember, no matter how strong your password is, its strength does you no good if you simply disclose it to the bad guys. Password threat number two is social engineering. Sometimes, as we've just seen, users might disclose their passwords simply by being careless. Other times, however, cyber criminals work behind the scenes to create social situations that encourage users to disclose their passwords. This is called social engineering. A cyber criminal is unlikely to simply call you up on the phone and shout, hey, you, give me your passwords. They will be more sneaky than that. They might call you on the phone and say that they're an IT professional from your school or your work. And under this disguise, they might ask you for your password. Don't fall for such schemes. And this telephone trick is only one example of social engineering. There are many, many kinds of social engineering out there. And we'll discuss social engineering a little more in later videos in this course. Password threat number three is phishing. Phishing is one kind of social engineering. It might be the most common kind. In phishing scams, a cyber criminal sends out bait, often in the form of an email. And that bait encourages unwitting users to voluntarily disclose their passwords. Here's an example of a real phishing email that I received in my university email inbox. Dear Chase customer, it says, your online account will expire today on Thursday, February 13th, 2014. 
To keep your account updated, please click log on to Chase Online and proceed with the verification process. Copyright 2014, J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. There are a lot of red flags in this email, but the most significant one is that I do not bank at Chase, so this is clearly a fraud. What do you think would happen if I clicked on that link? Now, I didn't click on it because it's not safe to click on fraudulent links like this, but if I had clicked on it, I'm sure I would have been confronted with some fake so-called verification forms, and I'm sure those forms would have asked me to enter my login information for Chase. If I did have a Chase account, and if I had entered my login information into those fraudulent forms, I'm sure that I would have been giving my banking information over to a cyber criminal. No bank or other legitimate institution will send you an urgent email insisting that you log into their website. In fact, you should avoid entering login information into any website that you have arrived at by clicking on a link in an email. If you receive suspicious or apparently urgent emails or even text messages from your bank or from any other institution that you do business with, you can always look up their phone number and call them on the phone and then ask them about it. In all likelihood, they'll inform you that the message you received was a scam and they'll recommend that you delete it. They may even ask you to provide more information about the scam so that they can prepare to defend their other customers against it. It's worth pointing out that strong passwords won't protect you from social engineering scams such as phishing scams. Only your wits and your wisdom will protect you from such scams. Password threat number four is key logging. Another way that cyber criminals discover passwords is through the use of key logging hardware or key logging software. Let's look at key logging hardware first. A keylogger keeps track of every keystroke made on a particular keyboard or on a particular computer. Keylogging hardware consists of small, discrete devices that plug into a computer's USB drive. These devices themselves contain a USB port, which the keyboard cable plugs into. Keylogging devices blend in well with the cables and plugs and ports on the back of a computer, and they're difficult to spot if you aren't looking for them. Although keyloggers are small, they can store months worth of keystroke records. So a cyber criminal could quickly install a keylogger into a public computer, say at a library, and then they could return for the keystroke records weeks or months later. But not all keyloggers require extra hardware devices. There is such a thing as keylogging software as well, and it's completely invisible from the outside of the computer. Keylogging software is a computer application that keeps track of your keystrokes. The keylogger might save those keystroke records on the computer to be extracted later, or it could even message the data to a third party somewhere else in the world through the internet. Because keylogging hardware is easy to install on public computers, it's good practice to avoid logging into private accounts on public computers. But for your own private devices, keylogging software is probably the greater threat. You can avoid keylogging software by only visiting websites that you trust so as to avoid unintentionally downloading the keylogging software. Of course, you should also only install software on your computer if you know and trust the source of that software. And remember, even if you're careful with your computer, your friends may not be careful with theirs. It's very difficult for a user to know whether their friends' computers have keylogging software on them. So it's a good idea to avoid logging into private accounts on a friend's computer. As a rule of thumb, security risks are usually greater on computers that you don't control. So can a strong password protect you from keylogging devices and keylogging software? Unfortunately, no. The best protections from keyloggers are informed use of your own computer and caution when using computers that are controlled by other people. Password threat number five is wireless sniffing. Have you ever seen a movie where somebody's having a private telephone conversation on a landline telephone, and then somebody else picks up a different phone somewhere else in the house and eavesdrops on that conversation? Well, wireless sniffing is a similar kind of eavesdropping that can happen on public wireless internet connections. Say you're in a coffee shop surfing the web. A cyber criminal within range of that wireless network can use a variety of methods to intercept the signals sent back and forth between your computer and the wireless router. So they can intercept the information that's sent from the wireless router to your computer. 
and they can also intercept the information that your computer sends to a wireless router. Can a strong password protect you from wireless sniffing? Again, no, it can't. The way to protect yourself from wireless sniffing will be to understand how wireless networks work, to understand the weaknesses that cybercriminals attack, and to understand how you can avoid those weaknesses. And we're going to discuss those things in more detail in other lessons. Password threat number six is brute force guessing. One way that cybercriminals discover passwords is by just guessing them. In a brute force attack, a cybercriminal uses a computer to try to guess every possible password for your account until she just happens to guess the right one. Can a strong password protect you from brute force guessing? Yes, it can. Short passwords take much less time to crack by these methods than long, strong passwords do. Every character that you add to your password makes your password exponentially more difficult to randomly guess. Furthermore, adding more kinds of characters will also make your password more difficult to guess. A long password consisting of lowercase letters is difficult to randomly guess, but a long password consisting of both lowercase and capital letters is much, much more difficult to randomly guess. Adding more keyboard symbols like numbers and punctuation marks adds even more possibilities for the brute force attacker to deal with. Websites will also help to protect you from brute force attackers by requiring users to complete a completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart, or a CAPTCHA as it's commonly abbreviated. A CAPTCHA presents symbols on the screen that are difficult for computers to interpret, but easy for humans. If the user can't interpret the CAPTCHA, then the website denies their login request. This way, even if a computerized attack does guess your password, the CAPTCHA helps to prevent the computer from automatically logging in to your account. Password threat number seven is dictionary attacks. Because there are practically innumerable possible passwords and cybercriminals don't have infinite time to spend trying to crack them, brute force guessing is often pretty impractical. However, in reality, users don't usually choose literally random strings of characters as their passwords because literally random strings of characters are difficult to remember. Users follow patterns when they create passwords, and many of them tend to follow the same patterns. Cybercriminals keep lists of popular passwords and popular password patterns, and they'll limit their password guessing to these lists. Such focused attacks are called dictionary attacks. Some dictionary attack lists will contain millions of potential passwords. That's a lot of passwords, and it's more than a person could work through on their own. But with the help of a computer, a cybercriminal can potentially work through such a list relatively quickly. Therefore, dictionary attacks are much more practical than brute force guessing attacks. Dictionary attacks usually target common passwords like the word password, 12345, the home row keys A S D F J K L semicolon, or the phrase let me in. they might also target public information about a user. For example, sometimes people will incorporate their own name, address, or phone number into their password. Cybercriminals know this, and so they'll sometimes add publicly available knowledge about a user into their dictionary attacks. Publicly available knowledge includes things like your name and telephone number, which might be available in a telephone directory. It also includes whatever information the public can see about you, on your social networking sites like Facebook or Twitter. If you tweet about your cat, then a cybercriminal might decide to incorporate your cat's name into a dictionary attack. Can a strong password protect you from dictionary attacks? Yes, it can. A strong password avoids common keywords and patterns that cybercriminals exploit in dictionary attacks. Password threat number eight is password files that aren't encrypted. In a previous lesson, I discussed the encryption of password files. In order to keep lists of user passwords safe, companies will normally encrypt them using an irreversible algorithm called a hash function. However, it turns out that not all companies hash their passwords. 
In 2009, hackers broke into a social media service called RockU and stole their password files. The passwords had not been encrypted, so the hackers obtained a list that displayed 32 million usernames and passwords in just plain, old, ordinary, unencrypted text. Now, there isn't much that you can do to protect yourself from such an attack. You just don't have very much control over whether or not a company encrypts your passwords. But the RockU attack has some instructive potential for us. The password list at RockU went public, and so we can use that list to determine some common user-chosen passwords. Since the bad guys have this list too, we know to avoid common passwords such as those at the very top of the RockU list. It's worth noticing that the top three passwords at RockU were 123456, 12345, and 12345678. A strong password won't protect your password from being stolen off of a company server. However, these attacks at least help us to understand which passwords we should avoid in the first place. Password security threat number nine is exposed passwords with known hash values. Sometimes, cyber criminals will steal a list of encrypted password files even though they don't have the means to break the encryption. So how is this useful to them? Well, it turns out that cyber criminals can often get access to the same algorithms that the good guys use to encrypt passwords. So there really isn't anything to stop a cyber criminal from taking a known password, running it through the algorithm, and seeing what value it spits out. Here, we can see that the word password gets converted into a long string of numbers and letters starting with 5F4. It's possible, and relatively easy, for cybercriminals to obtain long lists of common passwords and then to determine the hash values for all of them. Now, if a cybercriminal steals a company's list of encrypted passwords, they can search the encrypted passwords for hash values that match the list that they've made themselves. In this example, the username Gadget has an encrypted password that matches the encrypted value that was obtained by encrypting the word password. So that means that Gadget's password must also be the word password. So if hackers steal a list of encrypted passwords from a company that you do business with, they can sometimes figure out your password. They'll compare the stolen encrypted passwords to passwords that they have encrypted for themselves. However, a strong password will help to protect you from this kind of attack. The stronger your password is, the less likely it is to appear on a list of passwords that cybercriminals have encrypted for themselves. Password threat number 10 is security questions. What happens if you forget your own password? Many online businesses offer a password retrieval service so that losing your password doesn't necessarily mean that you'll lose your account altogether. Many password retrieval systems rely on security questions. To retrieve your password, you must answer a supposedly secret question correctly. If you get the question right, the service will email you your password or perhaps email you a link to a password reset service. The problem with this system is that security questions are often much easier to guess than the passwords themselves. Common security questions are, what is your mother's maiden name? Who was your childhood best friend? And what is your favorite pet's name? Sometimes it's really, really easy to obtain the answers to those questions. The answers might be posted on somebody's Facebook page, or maybe they'll be revealed in a tweet or an Instagram photo. So how should you deal with security questions? One good practice is to simply lie. Another method is to tell the truth, but to add a random string of characters at the end of your true response. This random string amounts to a secondary password. Even if a hacker knows the answer to your security question, she'll have a hard time guessing this secondary password. Most companies' password retrieval systems will lock out the user after a few failed attempts to answer the security question. Whether you choose to lie or to use the truth plus a secondary password, the hacker is unlikely to guess your security response in just a few guesses. They'll probably get locked out. 
Whichever solution you choose, one difficulty will remain. How should you go about remembering your response to the security question? If you can forget your password, then surely you can forget your response to the security question too, especially if it's a lie or involves a second password. In a future lecture, I'll share some recommendations for password management. Many of these recommendations will apply equally well to security questions as they do to passwords. Okay, so let's review. In this lesson, we touched on 10 common password threats. User disclosure, social engineering, phishing, key logging, wireless sniffing, brute force guessing, dictionary attacks, password files that are not encrypted, exposed passwords with known hash values, and finally, security questions. In the next video, we're going to talk about how to create a strong password. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 11, Creating Strong Passwords. In this video, I will show you a few strategies for turning a weak password into a strong one. Let's say that you have just set up a new online account and you need to choose a password. Naturally, you want something that will be easy to remember, so you type the first thing that comes to mind, the name of your beloved Persian cat, Muffin. As it stands, this is a weak password. It's especially weak if you have pictures of Muffin plastered all over your social media page or anywhere else on the web, because attackers do their homework. They might research you before trying to guess your password. One way to strengthen this password would be to add a variety of different symbols. So far, it's written entirely in lowercase letters. It would help to add some capital letters, numbers, and other keyboard symbols. Okay, now we have a strong password, but it's so random that it's difficult to remember. How can we make this password both strong and memorable? One way to make a strong password memorable is to make it tell a story. Let's imagine that you adopted Muffin from the shelter on Christmas Day in 2012. Well, we could start that story with Muffin's name. And the animal shelter is sometimes called the pound, so you could put a pound sign in there. And then you could shorten Christmas to just moss. And then you could finish it off with the year, 2012. There you have it. That's a password that tells a story. You got Muffin from the pound on Christmas in 2012. It's a story that you can remember, but one that other people are unlikely to guess. Notice that the password that we produced is long and contains a variety of symbols. Those are good things. Actually, this password is more than long enough. You could abbreviate some of the elements of this story if you wanted to. That might make it quicker to type. Another strategy for strengthening passwords is to replace letters with similar looking symbols. For example, muffin might become muff exclamation point n. Strong passwords should be at least eight characters long, so let's throw in a meaningful number. We'll use 12 because you adopted Muffin in 2012. There, we have once again created a reasonably strong password. You could also try using a sentence instead of a word as your password. For example, start with the sentence, Muffin likes yarn and treats. That would be a long password, and you might not want to type that much every time you sign into your new account. To shorten it, just take the first letter of each word and use that string of letters as your base password. From that base, you could substitute a symbol or two and maybe add a meaningful number. And presto, you have created a strong password. Another principle to consider is substituting soundalikes for conventional spellings. So maybe I love muffin could become something like this. Or you could try using symbols to separate words. For example, maybe muffin is great could become something like this. One way to make your password especially memorable is to base it on memorable song lyrics or movie lines. For example, 
muffins buying a stairway to heaven might be shortened to this. And then you could substitute characters and add meaningful numbers like this. As you can see, there are a lot of different ways to compose memorable passwords that are at least eight characters long and that use a lot of different symbols. Now that you know what to do, I'm going to share a few tactics to avoid. Avoid trivial passwords. Some of the most common passwords are password, one, two, three, four, five, the home row keys, A, S, D, F, J, K, L, semicolon, and let me in. These are all weak passwords. If somebody ever tries to break into one of your accounts, these will be among the first passwords that they try. Avoid relying on keyboard patterns for your password. For example, we have already seen that the keyboard pattern based passwords 12345 and ASDFJKL are both weak. The password left bracket SDDEPTF is also weak for similar reasons. Can you see what's wrong with it? Well, let's take a look. You see, the word password is an exceptionally common and exceptionally weak password. And it's typed like this. P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D. Now, some people think it's clever to shift their hands one key to the right and then to move their fingers as if they're typing the word password. Left bracket S-D-D-E-P-T-F. Cyber criminals are aware of this keyboard-based password trick and others like it. You're better off avoiding keyboard pattern-based passwords altogether. Finally, avoid the passwords that we discussed in this video and avoid passwords that you see in any other how to choose a password tutorial that you've ever seen before. Cyber criminals seek out these tutorials and they add the passwords that they find to their lists of common passwords. So although this tutorial demonstrates good password creation principles, the passwords themselves are weak by virtue of their being shared with the public. Okay, that's all of the password creation tips I have for you for today. I hope this gives you an idea of what works and what doesn't work. In the next lesson, I'm going to give you some advice for managing your passwords. Some people, in fact, maybe most people, have trouble keeping track of all their passwords because they just have so many of them. The next lesson is going to give you tips for dealing with that kind of problem. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 12, Managing Passwords. Many of you have probably heard it said that you should have a strong, unique password for each of your various password-protected accounts and devices. And you have probably also heard that you should change your passwords frequently and never, ever write down your passwords. But let's be practical. Obviously, taking all these recommendations together creates problems for your memory. Most of us can't remember an array of complex, constantly changing passwords, at least not without some help. So in this video, I'm going to share three tips for practical password management. Securely record your passwords, rank your passwords, and use password management software. Password management tip number one is to securely record your passwords. You may have heard before that you should never write your passwords down. To that, I say never say never. It's okay to record your passwords, you should just be thoughtful and secure about it. Of course, it's not secure to write your password down on a sticky note that you keep near your desk. And because computers are easy to search, it's not usually secure to keep your passwords in a simple computer folder. So if you write your passwords down, consider using a pen and paper rather than writing them on a document on your computer. And keep them in a secret, secure place. Just in case your password log is compromised, you should be sneaky about the way that you write them down. Don't label them as passwords and don't clearly label which passwords go to which accounts. Whenever possible, use some kind of keyword or code that only you will understand. 
In this example, I've embedded password clues into a phony and somewhat confusing guest list for a party. You should be able to come up with your own private system of clues that works for you. Something that you understand and something that you can remember. Password management tip number two is to rank your passwords. One way to cut down on the number of passwords that you have to remember is to rank your accounts into three tiers and to treat your passwords differently depending on which tier it falls into. In the first tier are the accounts where you have the most at stake. For example, your primary email account and your financial accounts would be tier one accounts. For these accounts, you should choose a strong, unique password for each account and make a standing appointment with yourself to change these passwords every six months. In the second tier are the accounts where you have a medium amount at stake. For example, with Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts, you probably have a medium amount at stake. These accounts are full of private information, but they can't normally be used to defraud you directly. People can't steal from you using Facebook, at least not yet. For these accounts, you should choose strong, unique passwords and make a standing appointment with yourself to change them once a year. For these accounts, instead of composing whole new passwords for every account, it might make sense to simply cycle through your passwords. For example, maybe you make your old Facebook password become your new Twitter password, and maybe your old Twitter password becomes your new Instagram password, and so on. In the third tier are accounts where you have little at stake. For accounts where you feel like you have little at stake, for example, maybe the login information that you use for an online newspaper, you should choose a strong password and just reuse it across several accounts. It's not really necessary to change the passwords on these lowest security accounts unless you have reason to believe that one of them has been compromised. If you think that an account has been compromised, you should change the password and also change the answers to any of your security questions that are associated with that account. If the account isn't particularly important to you anyway, then you might consider just deleting it altogether and starting over with a new account. Password management tip number three is to use password management software. Web browsers provide the option of remembering passwords for you, and this can be helpful. If your web browser remembers your passwords for you, then you're unlikely to forget your passwords. Also, the web browser will probably automatically fill in the passwords for you, which means you don't have to type your password quite so frequently. Typing your password less frequently makes you less vulnerable to, say, a keylogging attack, which is a kind of attack where cybercriminals use special hardware or special software to record the keystrokes on your computer. Of course, relying on your web browser to remember your passwords has its trade-offs. If your web browser stores all of your passwords, then anybody who gains access to your web browser also has access to your passwords. For this reason, if you're going to allow your web browser to remember your passwords for you, then it's a good idea to password protect your web browser itself. Most web browsers have security settings that allow you to set up a password protected account for the browser itself. You may also consider using another kind of password management software. For example, the Firefox add-on LastPass will generate strong passwords and remember them for you. But once again, using such software does have trade-offs, the management software itself becomes a single point of failure. Whether you're using a web browser or a web browser add-on to manage your passwords, these management programs are usually accessible by one single master password. If that master password to become lost, stolen, or shared, then all of your accounts could be compromised. Many security experts recommend that people use password management software, and so it is a good idea but you still have to be very careful with your master password. Okay, that's all I have for you for now concerning password management. We've covered three tips in this video to securely record your passwords, to rank your passwords, and to use password management software. I hope these three tips help you to find a password management strategy that works well for you. In the next video, we're going to begin learning about email and some of the security issues that come with it. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy.
This is lesson 13, how email works. In this lesson, we are going to examine two illustrations that help us to understand how computers send, store, and receive emails. Some of you may be watching these videos for a course that uses this textbook. The illustrations that we're going to look at in this video are both from chapter 4. Now, if you aren't using this textbook, don't worry about it. Just follow along with the video. To begin, let's examine an illustration that summarizes the basic parts of an email system. For now, let's pretend that an email message is moving from left to right. The sender is the user on the left, and the recipient is the user on the right. To help us to talk about these users, let's give them names. I'll call the user on the left Jack, and the one on the right Jill. Jack will begin by writing and addressing the email using what is called a user agent. In Jack's case, his user agent is an email application that lives on his own computer. Examples of such applications include Microsoft Outlook or Mozilla's open source Thunderbird email application. These applications are compatible with private email systems, like the one that Jack uses. What exactly is a private email system? Well, most people don't use private email systems for their personal emails anymore, so you may not be familiar with private email systems. Most of us are probably more familiar with web-based user agents attached to web-based email services. Examples of web-based user agents include Gmail, Hotmail, and Yahoo Mail. However, some people prefer private email services that can only be accessed from private user agent applications. Many businesses and workplaces will use private systems like these. For private email systems, users must have an email application like Outlook or Thunderbird installed on their computer in order to access their private emails. A private email system also means that Jack's emails are stored on Jack's private network. In fact, he may just store them right on his computer. If we look over to the right side of the illustration, we see that Jill has a web-based user agent. A web-based user agent stores Jill's emails out on the web somewhere. It also means that Jill can send and receive emails from any computer with an internet connection. Jack can only send and receive emails from within his private network, which contains a very limited number of computers. In fact, if it's a home network, Jack may only have one computer connected to it. So Jack writes an email, and then he sends it off through the internet. Jack's email must travel from his private email system through a series of servers called Message Transfer Agents, or MTAs, before it can reach its destination over on Jill at the right side of the page. Jack composes his message in his user agent, and then when he hits send, the user agent sends the email to the first message transfer agent. That message transfer agent sends the email to another message transfer agent, which sends it through the internet to a third message transfer agent. The final message transfer agent would store the message until Jill's web-based user agent requested access to new incoming emails. This user agent accesses the email for Jill, but since the user agent is web-based, the information has to travel through a completely different internet path between the user agent and Jill's computer. If Jill wanted to send a message back to Jack, the whole process would be reversed. Jill would write a message in her user agent, which appears in her web browser. When she hits send, the email would travel through the internet to her web-based email client. This email client would forward the email to a message transfer agent. The message would travel across the internet through various message transfer agents, and the final message transfer agent would keep the email in storage until Jack's user agent requested access to new incoming emails. In this illustration, you can see that the connections between message transfer agents are labeled SMTP. SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, which is the communications protocol that message transfer agents use to communicate with each other. You might think of SMTP as the language of email servers, kind of like how internet protocol is the language of the internet. Let's examine one more illustration that shows how email systems work. This one shows many of the same things that we just saw in the first illustration, but it highlights some different details. In this illustration, we see a user, Alice, 
sending a message to another user, Bob. Her message is composed of a short text message that says, Hi, Bob, and then there's a picture of a palm tree. Alice sends this email using her user agent, which relays the message to a message transfer agent. The message transfer agent sends the email across the internet to a second message transfer agent. This second message transfer agent holds the email for Bob until his user agent downloads all of his new incoming emails. Bob can view the email through his user agent. This illustration helps to show us how email addressing works. When Alice addresses this email, she specifies that it should go to bob at dougj.net. Well, where exactly is dougj.net? It turns out that everything following the at in an email address is the name of a specific message transfer agent somewhere on the internet. So, in a non-technical sense, the email system asks Alice, which message transfer agent do you want me to send this email to? Alice responds, the one for dougj.net. And then the email system asks, okay, now which user at the message transfer agent do you want me to deliver this email to once it gets there? And Alice responds, send it to Bob. The email address tells the computer, send this email to the username Bob at the mail server called dougj.net. Now, every email keeps an official record of what it is and where it's been. When Alice first composes the email, all it contains is a message and an address. However, once she hits send, her user agent will attach a header that gives the recipient more information. It will add a return address, which shows the recipient who the email came from. It will also add something called a MIME header. MIME stands for Multipurpose Internet Mail Extension. It turns out that when email protocols were first designed, they were only designed to handle plain text messages. However, MIME allows email systems to work around this limitation. The MIME header allows emails to carry different design elements that go beyond plain text, elements such as images, special fonts, and file attachments. The MIME header on an email will explain what the email contains. In this case, it will say that Alice's email contains text and an image. When the message goes to the first message transfer agent, that message transfer agent leaves a header of its own so that there's a record of where the email has been. All subsequent message transfer agents will leave headers of their own as well. In this illustration, there are only two message transfer agents, and so the email only picks up two message transfer agent headers. The email arrives at Bob's user agent with all of these headers attached. In many cases, the headers will end up being much longer than the email message itself. To reduce clutter, most modern user agents won't display all of these headers, at least not by default. In Bob's case, he can only see the message and a reduced header that tells him who sent it. However, user agents will allow you to see the full header if you ask for it. You could try this with one of your own emails. To view one of these full headers in your user agent, open an email and look for an option that says something like view full header or display message details or something like that. Normally, you wouldn't have much reason to be interested in these headers. That's why most modern user agents hide them but sometimes they are useful. For example, it is useful that a header keeps a record of where an email has been. Sometimes, cybercriminals will send forged emails that pretend to come from a trusted source, say your workplace or your grandma. But if you learn to read email headers, you can check for yourself which message transfer agents the email originated from. Cybercriminals can fake the return address on an email but they cannot fake the message transfer agent headers. If you receive a suspicious email that claims to be from your grandma, it's possible to check the detailed header of the email to determine whether it really came from the same message transfer agent as your grandma's other emails. Okay, that's all for now about email systems. Of course, there is much more to learn about how email works, but if you followed along with this lecture, then you probably already know more than most casual users do. In the next video, we'll talk about security threats that come through email, and we'll identify some ways to avoid, or at least to minimize, these threats.
Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 14, Email Security. In this lecture, we'll touch on six common email threats. Eavesdropping, spamming and phishing, spoofing, malicious email attachments, replying and forwarding issues, and carbon copy and blind carbon copy issues. Email threat number one is eavesdropping. Eavesdropping is when other people observe your internet traffic without you knowing it. There are two primary eavesdropping threats. The first is the threat of somebody eavesdropping by simply observing you without your knowing it. Sometimes people will just look over your shoulder and watch what you're doing. They could observe things like your passwords, or they could read your emails if they're open on your screen. Another kind of eavesdropping is called sniffing. Sniffing is when an eavesdropper uses a computer to intercept the radio signals traveling between your computer and wireless router. They might intercept your username and password when you log into your email account, and they might intercept the emails themselves as they're sent to and from your web browser for your viewing. If your email service encrypts your email traffic, then that will help to protect you from sniffing and many web-based email services do encrypt email traffic. But if your email traffic is unencrypted, then sniffing can be a serious threat. Email threat number two is spamming and phishing. Sending emails is cheap. For most of us, all it costs is our time, and it costs about the same amount of time to send an email to 10 people as it does to send an email to 10,000 people, assuming you have that many people on your contacts list. That's why email has become the communication of choice for many advertisers and scammers. They can send a tremendously high volume of messages at almost no cost. The costs are so low that even if only a tiny fraction of the recipients respond, then those responses can pay off. Spam is a kind of advertising email. Spam is usually unsolicited, that is, you never asked anybody to send it to you. And it's normally junk mail that simply wastes your time. Spam is more of a nuisance than a security threat. Phishing emails, on the other hand, are a security threat. Here's an example of a real phishing email that showed up in my inbox. Phishing emails look like an email from a legitimate entity, such as a bank or a social network. However, phishing emails are sent out by scammers who are trying to get you to give them private information, usually usernames and passwords. This one is supposed to look like it came from a real bank, Chase. But I don't bank at Chase. This email is just trying to direct me to a fake banking webpage that is designed to trick me into sharing my banking information. In a lot of cases, phishing emails are sent out as mass emails to hundreds or thousands of email addresses at a time. The scammers can send all of these emails for cheap, and they'll make a profit if only one or two recipients fall for the trick. Email threat number three is spoofing. With emails, it's possible to fake a return address. It's similar to a paper letter, actually. Have you ever sent a letter through the postal service but forgot to put a return address on it? Or have you sent a letter but accidentally put the wrong return address on it? Chances are that the letter probably still reached its destination. The postal service doesn't need a return address to deliver a letter. They don't even look at the return address unless they're unable to deliver the letter for some reason. Just like the postal service, email services don't need an accurate return address to deliver a message. You can send an email from one account, but say that you're sending it from another account. And the system will usually deliver the email to the correct recipient anyway. Email systems don't usually need to know the sender's address, they just need the recipient's address. Some scanners use this feature for a scam tactic called spoofing. A spoofed email is one that says it's from one person, but actually came from somebody else. On a spoofed email, the return address is just a fake. Phishing scammers and other cyber criminals sometimes spoof their emails. They will say that an email comes from a trusted person or a trusted institution, even though it really didn't. Now, the key to telling a spoofed email from a legitimate email is the email header. Do you remember in Lesson 13 when we talked about the full header that comes along with each email? 
the full header tells us where an email really came from. A savvy email user who learns to read the full header of an email can use the information in the header to tell the difference between a spoofed email and a genuine email. Email threat number four is malicious email attachments. As you probably already know, you can use emails to send file attachments to other people. These files could be documents, images, or even software programs. Cybercriminals take advantage of this functionality by using emails to deliver malicious software straight to a user's computer. One common method is to send an intriguing email that encourages the user to open the attachment out of curiosity. For example, check out this phony order confirmation email. I'll stop talking for a moment to give you a chance to pause the video and read the email if you like. Can you see how this email is intended to confuse the recipient? If you got this email but hadn't made a purchase that corresponds to this confirmation order, then you might wonder what's going on and who should you contact to sort out the problem. In a state of confusion, a recipient might open the attachment hoping that it would shed some much needed light on the situation. But this attachment will just make everything worse. This attachment is a .exe file, which means that it will automatically run some program when you open it. When the file runs, it's sure to install malicious software right onto your computer. Email threat number five is replying and forwarding. The reply button and the forward button are helpful email tools. Neither is associated with any direct security risks per se, but they do involve some privacy issues that are worth mentioning. You should remember that the reply and forward buttons make emails really, really easy to share, even on accident sometimes. Before you do something silly like send passwords or embarrassing photos through email, consider how easy it is for the recipient to share that information with everybody in his or her address book. Don't hit send unless you really, really mean it. And be especially careful about what you send to your boyfriend or your girlfriend. It's sad and it's unfortunate, but a lot of people send sensitive information to a boyfriend or a girlfriend only to have the information forwarded to hundreds of other people after a nasty breakup. Because forwarding takes so little effort, it only takes a passing moment of weakness, anger, or bad judgment for somebody to forward sensitive information to practically everybody they know. So remember that even if you trust somebody now, you may not be able to trust him or her forever. In many cases, trust is temporary, but the forward button is forever. Furthermore, you would be wise to remember the distinction between the reply button in an email system and the reply all button. Reply automatically addresses your response email to one address, the address that sent you the email in the first place. Reply all automatically addresses your response to everybody who received the email. Many email users have embarrassed themselves by accidentally hitting reply all and thereby sending a sensitive message to a large group of people rather than just sending it to one specific person. Email threat number six are the two carbon copy and blind carbon copy functions. Okay, this one is not technically a threat, but it's still a good idea to cover the difference between the to field, the carbon copy or CC field, and the blind carbon copy or BCC field in an email address bar. Most of you have probably used the to field before. That's where you type the address of a person to whom you want to send an email. Simple enough, to sends email to people, easy peasy. Many of you have probably also used the carbon copy or CC field before. If you have, you know that your email user agent will also send an email to any address listed in the CC field. So what's the difference between to and carbon copy? Well, they function almost exactly the same. The only real difference is that the carbon copy field is intended for recipients other than the primary recipient. For example, imagine that you're working on a group project in a class, and imagine that your instructor has asked you to submit the project via email. On the day that you submit the project, you might write an email to the teacher and attach your project to the email. 
and then you might decide to include all of your partner's email addresses in the carbon copy field. That way, they'll get the email, and they can see that you submitted the project on time. When they receive the email, they will see that they're in the CC field instead of the To field, and they will know immediately that they are not intended to be the primary recipients of the email. They can then read or not read the email accordingly, from the mindset of a non-primary recipient. Some of you may have used the blind carbon copy or BCC field before, but I suspect that this field is unfamiliar to some of you. Blind carbon copy works just like carbon copy. It sends the email to non-primary recipients, but with one important difference. Blind carbon copy keeps these extra recipients a secret. When you CC people on an email, everybody who receives that email can see who has been CC'd on it. When you list addresses in the blind carbon copy field of an email, only the sender and the BCC'd receiver can see who is BCC'd in the email. So imagine that you're planning a surprise birthday party for a friend. You decide that you're going to take her out for bowling and then surprise her by having 10 of her friends waiting for her at the bowling alley. The day of the event, you might send her a confirmation to make sure that she's going to come out for the party. And you could list all of the surprise guests in the blind carbon copy field of the email. This way, everybody receives the confirmation email, but the primary recipient can't see that there are surprise guests who also received the confirmation. Blind carbon copy allows you to send the same email to multiple people, but it also gives you better control over who can and cannot see who else received the email. Okay, that's all for now about email security. In this lesson, we covered six email threats. Eavesdropping, spamming and phishing, spoofing, malicious email attachments, replying and forwarding issues, and carbon copy and blind carbon copy issues. In the next lesson, we're going to start learning about malicious software, or malware. Computer viruses are one example of malware, but as you're about to see, Viruses aren't the only kind of malware that can infect your computer. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 15, Varieties of Malware. In this video, we are going to discuss different kinds of malicious software. By malicious, we mean that this software is intended to harm computer users, to irritate them, or to steal information from them. In cybersecurity lingo, we combine the words malicious and software together into a single word, malware. In this lecture, I'm going to define several common varieties of malware, viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and bots. The first type of malware that I'm going to talk about is viruses. Most of you have probably heard the term computer virus before, but what exactly is a computer virus? In the traditional definition, a computer virus is an unwanted program that attaches itself onto a host file on a computer. This is similar to real biological viruses, which attach themselves to host cells in a body. There is another analogy between computer viruses and biological viruses based on the way that they spread between hosts. Viruses cannot spread from person to person unless those two people interact somehow. For example, by sneezing on one another. <coughs> computer viruses work in a similar way. A computer virus copies itself, but those copies don't just spread to new computers on their own. Instead, a host must do the spreading somehow. There are many ways that computer users can accidentally spread computer viruses. Some common ones include sharing infected USB devices, sharing infected files on peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks, or sharing infected files in emails. The second type of malware that I'm going to talk about is worms. On the traditional definition, worms are self-sufficient programs. We just saw that viruses live in host files on a computer. But worms are programs that hide out on a computer without the aid of a host file. 
a virus is just a string of malicious code that can't function without a host, but a worm is its own separate program. Unlike viruses, worms are often able to spread themselves throughout a computer network. When a worm becomes attached to a computer, it normally tries to spread to all the other computers on the same network as the original host computer. It doesn't matter if it's a wired network or a wireless network. A worm can spread itself using either kind. In fact, the network itself is often the target of a worm. The idea is that by infecting all or many of the computers on a network, a worm can slow down the network itself, rendering the network useless. The third type of malware that I'm going to talk about here is Trojan horses. Trojan horses are like worms in that they are normally independent programs that run on your computer. They don't need to attach themselves to a host file in the same way that viruses do. But Trojan horses don't necessarily spread like worms do. What makes Trojan horses unique is that they spread by tricking computer users into voluntarily downloading them. A Trojan horse will appear to be some kind of valuable computer file, but when users download that file, they receive malware that they weren't expecting. Just as the Trojan horse of Greek mythology appeared to be a gift, but was actually filled with menacing Greek raiders, Trojan horse software will appear to be an enticing download, but it will be full of menacing malware. The fourth type of malware that I'm going to talk about here is bots. Bot is short for robot. Most of the time, when we think of robots, we think of physical machines that can perform tasks that are normally performed by human beings. The term bot in cybersecurity lingo is similar. A bot is a malicious program that automatically performs functions on your computer that are normally performed by the user. For example, a bot might send emails, or pull up web pages, or change your computer settings, or many other things, and all that without the user's permission. Now, sometimes a bot is simply programmed to do those things on its own without any input, but sometimes bots are actually capable of receiving commands from a third party user called a bot master. Bot masters use bots to control your computer without your consent or even your awareness. Like a worm, bots can replicate themselves. However, unlike a worm, a bot is usually very careful about replication. Worms are normally programmed to replicate very quickly. The rapid spread of a worm can create so much traffic on a computer network that the network slows down or completely crashes. Indeed, this is often the purpose of worms, to damage a network. Bots, on the other hand, usually replicate relatively slowly so that they can avoid being noticed. Similarly, bots are frequently designed so that they will run on a computer completely undetected. Now, viruses are normally designed to damage a computer. But bots are designed to run smoothly along with other computer programs. But that doesn't mean that bots aren't harmful. A bot can receive commands from a remote bot master, and so a bot gives partial control of your computer over to some other user at some other location. And that can be a very harmful thing. Throughout this video, I've referred to four distinct types of malware. Viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and bots. However, in the real world, Boundaries are fuzzy between all the different kinds of malware. It can be difficult to categorize real pieces of malware as just viruses or just worms. Sometimes a piece of malware will attach itself to a file like a virus does, but it will have the capacity to spread itself like a worm does. Or maybe it will be a Trojan horse download that leaves a bot on your computer. Now, the term virus has become the catch-all term for discussing malware in casual conversation. But as you can see, there are a great many varieties of malware out there, each with their own purposes, their own strengths, and their own weaknesses. 
Okay, that's all the further we'll go in this video. In the next lesson, we'll talk more about what malware can do to your computer. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 16, Functions of Malware. In the previous video, I described four common kinds of malware, viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and bots. In this video, we're going to explore seven common functions of malware, so we'll see some of the things that malware can do. Malware can have a practically infinite variety of negative effects on a computer or a network. The only limits to what malware can do are the creativity and the ill will of the malware programmers. But we'll stick to just these seven functions for now. These seven functions are overwhelming system resources, running malicious adware, running spyware, running ransomware, creating backdoors, disabling security functions, and creating botnets. Malware function number one is overwhelming system resources. Some pieces of malware, especially worms, are programmed to reproduce and spread as quickly as possible. Malware like this can often overwhelm computer or network resources. The spreading worm might use up so much of the network's bandwidth that there just isn't enough left over to perform legitimate functions on the network. Some malware creates innumerable files on a computer, clogging up its storage drives and eventually slowing the computer's performance. Other malware might use up so much of the computer's computing power or its working memory that the computer is unable to run legitimate programs effectively. The common thread connecting these examples is that malware somehow overwhelms the system that it attacks, rendering the system sluggish or even useless until somebody removes the malware. This particular kind of malware attack is relatively less common today than it used to be in the past. Today's malware programmers are usually trying to make money, and there is generally not much money to be made from obviously compromising a system like this. When something is obviously wrong, users quickly figure out that they have a problem and they do something about it. Most malware today is more sneaky. It operates quietly in the background, preferring to remain unnoticed by the user. That's not to say that the malware doesn't still affect computer performance, but today's malware is less likely to affect it so quickly and so dramatically that users are likely to notice that something is wrong right away. Malware function number two is running malicious adware. All of you have probably seen adware before. Any software that displays advertisements is technically adware. The web is obviously packed with adware because most of the free websites that we use are funded, at least in part, by advertising revenues. Much of the adware that we encounter runs on a web browser which simply displays the ads. Common, everyday adware might be a nuisance, and in some cases, people argue that it breaches user privacy, but in general, the costs of adware are the price that we choose to pay for the free websites that we use. However, some malware programs install mean, nasty, malicious adware onto computers themselves without the user's consent. Rather than just displaying the paid advertisements that support websites, these malware programs can display ads that have no legitimate connection to the user or to the websites that the user visits. Malicious adware might display unwanted pop-up ads at inappropriate times, or it might install an unwanted toolbar on your browser window. Furthermore, malicious adware sometimes presents ads that most users find distasteful or offensive. Malware function number three is running spyware. Spyware is malware that spies on your computer activity. One example of spyware is keylogging software that secretly records the keystrokes that you make on your keyboard and then sends that data to some third party. Other kinds of spyware might secretly monitor your internet activity and use your browsing information to target you with malicious advertisements. 
Spyware programmers want their spyware to remain hidden on your computer for as long as possible. You normally will not notice a spyware program until you're looking for it, and even then, they're programmed to be difficult to find and easy to overlook. Malware function number four is running ransomware. Ransomware programs create screens that look something like the one that you see here. Let's read what this message says. User alerts. Your documents have been encrypted. They can only be decrypted for $500 American dollars. If you do not pay this decryption fee by 14 days, your documents will be permanently deleted immediately. Do not call the police or risk automatic permanent file deletion immediately. Click below to begin decrypting your files. You will need a valid credit card. Thanks you. Sometimes ransomware is a total lie. Cyber criminals will write programs that will display messages like this one, even if your files are completely unaffected. And sometimes ransomware really does encrypt your files. In either case, you shouldn't play along with a scheme like this. Even if your files are really encrypted, there's no guarantee that the cyber criminal will unencrypt them for you if you pay the ransom. And if you do pay the ransom, some cyber criminals will use your payment information to steal your identity or to suck you deeper and deeper into an even more expensive scam. If you fall victim to ransomware, you are much better off restoring your system from backup files than you would be if you paid the ransom. If you diligently back up your system, then ransomware should be a nuisance for you, but it shouldn't be a catastrophic loss. Malware function number five is creating backdoors. Many legitimate programs create links between your computer and another computer system so that your computer can receive important updates. For example, Microsoft releases security updates on the second Tuesday of every month, and computers running Windows will download and sometimes install these updates by default. Many malware programs also establish connections between an infected computer and another system. But the connections that malware programs establish are secret, and they're intended to strengthen the malware, not to strengthen the computer. Using these secret connections, cyber criminals can update malware to make it more harmful, more difficult to remove, or more difficult to identify. These secret malicious connections are called backdoors. If a malware program creates a backdoor, then it can use that backdoor to modify itself or to install even more malware programs onto the infected computer. Malware function number six is disabling security functions. Some malware programs can disable security functions on a computer. For example, it could disable antivirus software, or it could block the system from installing security patches. Malware that disables the security functions on a computer tends to last longer because there aren't any security functions left to stop it. And these programs also tend to leave computers more vulnerable to other malware infections from other sources. Malware function number seven is creating botnets. In the previous lesson, I discussed bots. Bots are malware programs that can control your computer without your input. For example, they might automatically send emails, or retrieve web pages, or change computer settings, or submit usernames, passwords, or financial data into a website. Some cyber criminals will create bots that they can control through back doors on a user's computer. These cyber criminals who control networks of malicious bots are called bot masters. Bot masters will develop vast networks of thousands of computers that they can control through their bots. These bot-controlled networks are called botnets. Bot masters can use their botnets in a variety of ways. One of the most common uses is to crash a website. They do this by asking all of the bots on the botnet to visit the website at the same time. If the botnet is big enough, the website won't be able to handle all of the traffic, and it will crash. Or, as a variation on this attack, the botmaster might threaten to crash a particular website at a really inconvenient time, or maybe even at a financially ruinous time. The botmasters tell the owners of the website that they're going to crash it unless the owners agree to pay a ransom. For example, gambling websites are popular targets for botnet attacks. Botmasters will threaten to crash gambling websites before or during the Super Bowl, which is the busiest time of the year for most gambling websites. 
Okay, in this video, we've covered seven different functions of malware. Overwhelming system resources, running malicious adware, running spyware, running ransomware, creating backdoors, disabling security functionality, and creating botnets. Now, this list is by no means complete. There are many other malicious possibilities, but these seven should give you a pretty good idea of what you're up against. In the next lesson, I'll help you to understand the sources of malware, so that you have a better idea of how to avoid the attacks that I've just been describing. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 17, Sources of Malware. In this lecture, I'm going to describe eight common sources of malware. Removable media, documents and executables, internet downloads, network connections, email attachments, drive-by downloads, pop-ups, and malicious advertisements. Malware source number one is removable media. The very first computer virus, way back in 1982, was called the Elk Cloner virus. Elk Cloner targeted Apple II computers, and its effect was that every 50th time users booted up an infected computer, the computer would display something called the Elk Cloner poem. The poem went like this. Elk Cloner, the program with personality. It will get on all your disks. It will infiltrate your chips. Yes, it's cloner. It will stick to you like glue. It will modify RAM too. Send in the cloner. Here's how Elk Cloner spread. Back then, computers stored practically everything on floppy disks. Every time a floppy disk was inserted into the computer, the computer would run code stored on the disk to load or boot the disk onto the computer. Elk Cloner would start out attached to the boot code of a floppy disk. When an infected disk was inserted into an Apple II computer, Elk Cloner would copy itself onto that computer. Once the computer was infected, it would copy Elk Cloner back onto any uninfected disks that were inserted into the computer at a later time. As you can imagine, since everything ran on floppy disks back then, a user's disk library could easily become infected all the way through. If a user ever shared an infected disk with a friend, which of course many users frequently did, then they would spread Elk Cloner to their friend's computer, and that would likely infect most of their friend's floppy disks as well. Elk Cloner was what is called a boot sector virus, living and propagating in the boot code on removable media devices. We don't use floppy disks anymore, but we still use removable media that automatically loads when plugged into a computer. These removable media devices can still carry boot sector viruses today. USB flash drives are popular carriers for boot sector viruses. One tactic for spreading boot sector viruses via USB drives is simply to leave infected USB drives on the ground in public places. Curious people will find the USB drives and frequently they'll plug them into their own computers. These people are often good Samaritans who are just looking for information that will help them to return the USB drive to its rightful owner. If you find a flash drive in a public place, never plug it into a computer, just leave it alone. If you feel compelled to be a good Samaritan, you could take it to the nearest lost and found and hope that the owner checks in on it, but you should realize that the people at the lost and found may not have the cybersecurity understanding that you have. They might try to plug the USB drive into their own machines after you leave. In that case, you would have been instrumental in delivering the virus to the victim. Malware source number two is documents and executables. A virus is a specific type of malware, one that attaches itself to a legitimate document file or a legitimate program file. <laughs> Mundane documents like word processor files or PDFs can contain viruses, so any means of sharing documents is potentially a means of sharing viruses. The good news is that viruses that are attached to a document or an executable file cannot infect your computer unless you interact with them. 
That is, you have to actually open the document or run the executable file for the virus to take hold. What do we do if many of the file types that we use every day can potentially contain computer viruses? Obviously, we can't just refuse to open all files. If we did that, we couldn't really use our computers. What we can do is use discretion. Only share files and storage devices with people that you trust. Don't share files or storage devices with people that you don't trust. And if somebody you trust shares a suspicious file with you, remember that you don't have to open it. If something about a file from a trusted friend seems suspicious to you, you can usually just delete the file or call the person up on the phone who is sharing it with you to get more information about what it is that they're sharing. Malware source number three is internet downloads. In a previous lesson, I talked about Trojan horses. Trojan horses are malware that come disguised as legitimate files. Trojan horses often originate in internet downloads. For example, a website might offer free downloadable games, but when you download the game files, they could install games and malware onto your computer, or perhaps just the malware and no game at all. Because of the danger of Trojan horses, it's important to know the sources that you download from. You should only download known files from people that you know personally or from vendors that you trust. When you see good deals on downloadable products online, you should always approach those deals with skepticism. If you do not trust the vendor, don't download the product. If you don't recognize the vendor, then the safest thing to do is to ignore the offer. If you don't know the vendor, but you feel like you can't ignore the offer, then you should at least research the vendor on a couple of trusted review websites before downloading anything from them. Malware source number four is network connections. Some malware don't even need human assistance to reproduce and to infect new computers. These malware, usually called worms, distribute themselves across networks without victims having to interact with them at all. Anytime you're connected to a network, either to a private network or to the public internet, it's at least possible that your computer could contract a worm from another computer on the network. It doesn't matter whether it's a wired internet connection or a wireless connection either. Worms can spread across either. Some worms spread across the world, infecting millions of internet connected devices in a matter of days or hours. Of course, most of us connect to the internet every day and some of us never disconnect from it. So how is it that we aren't constantly contracting worms? Well, worms can only spread if they can exploit some known security weakness in a system. When weaknesses become known, software companies usually send out remedies for these weaknesses. These remedies are called patches. Patches modify legitimate software to make them more resistant to security breaches. If you install patches for your software as soon as they become available, then your computer is much less likely to contract a worm. Another security measure that helps computers to resist worms is the use of firewalls. A firewall is a tool that controls the flow of information between your computer and other network devices. In this illustration, we see a firewall between a computer and a cloud, which represents the internet. The firewall will prevent unrequested internet traffic, like worms, from accessing your computer. It's a good idea to always run a firewall on your computer. Malware source number five is email attachments. One way that cybercriminals spread malware is through social engineering. Social engineering is the practice of setting up social situations that encourage computer users to let down their guard, to compromise their own cyber defenses. One common method of social engineering is to attach malware-infected files to emails. The email might claim to come from a known source, and the body of the email will usually say something that piques the reader's interest or makes them feel concerned. One example of a malicious attachment is the infamous love bug worm. The love bug spread itself through email attachments, and it would send itself to all of the addresses stored on a user's computer. It would arrive in a victim's inbox packaged as an attachment with the file name loveletter4u.txt.vbs. Can you see how the file name attempts to hide the real file type of this email? The file type is really .vbs, 
but the title tries to make the reader think that it's a .txt file. If you already know a little something about file types, you know that .txt files are usually safe, but that .vbs files can contain malware. Many recipients were curious to see what this supposed love letter was all about, and so they opened the file, assuming that it was just a harmless note. Back in the year 2000, the love bug infected more than 500 million computers in just one week. Email attachments are incredibly useful, but it's important that you only open attachments that you can trust. Malware source number six is drive-by downloads. Many computer users realize that they can contract malware by downloading files from a malicious website. But what many users don't realize is that you can contract malware infections simply by visiting a malicious website. Whenever your computer pulls up a website, your computer is downloading and running code from a computer somewhere else on the internet. The web code that runs on your computer when you visit a website can contain malware. When simply visiting a website causes your computer to download malware, this is called a drive-by download. Because of the lurking threat of drive-by downloads, it pays to be aware of which pages you visit on the web. Avoid hyperlinks that take you to unfamiliar or untrusted web pages. Malware source number seven is pop-ups. Some web pages allow advertisers to display pop-up advertisements, which are advertisements that appear on your monitor in a separate browser window. Many of these pop-ups are just annoying, but some of them are legitimate security threats. Some malware distributors will use pop-up ads to direct users to a page that contains a drive-by download. Other times, pop-up ads will contain buttons, and sometimes clicking on those buttons will result in a malware download. One particularly sneaky variety of pop-up is called scareware. Scareware pop-ups display browser windows that are designed to look like an antivirus program. The scareware window will claim that it has scanned your computer and that it's discovered that you have a bunch of malware infections. To help induce fear, scareware windows will often claim that your computer is practically overrun with malware. The window will usually contain several buttons, and if the user is tricked, he or she might click on one of those buttons. Clicking on scareware windows is a bad idea. If you click on them, they will normally direct you to a malicious website where you're likely to contract malware infections like the ones that the scareware window claimed that you had in the first place. Malware source number eight is malicious advertisements. Malicious advertisements are difficult to distinguish from regular advertisements. Malware distributors will sometimes pay for advertising space on legitimate websites. Unlike regular advertisements, if you click on a malicious advertisement, it will take you to a malicious web page, which may contain drive-by downloads, Trojan horses, or links to other web pages that contain some kind of malware. Now, to be clear, I'm not trying to imply that any of the advertisements on this particular page are malicious. In all likelihood, they are perfectly safe. However, you should understand that it's always possible for malware distributors to buy ad space. Of course, you can avoid malicious advertisements simply by refraining from clicking on advertisements altogether. You might find it helpful to download ad blocking software for your web browser, such as Adblock Plus for Firefox. This program will prevent most ads from displaying on your web browser in the first place. Okay, let's review. In this video, I've shared eight potential sources of malware. Removable media, documents and executables, internet downloads, network connections, email attachments, drive-by downloads, pop-ups, and malicious advertisements. My hope is that the better you understand where malware comes from, the better prepared you will be to avoid malware altogether. In the next lesson, we'll go into a little more depth on the topic of defending yourself against malware infections. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 18, Layers of Defense Against Malware. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the layers of defense that will help to protect you from a malware attack. We will introduce five layers of defense, backing up data, using a firewall, installing software patches, 
using antivirus software, and user education. None of these layers is particularly powerful by itself, but taken together, they constitute a firm defense. As long as you use a computer, you will always be at some risk of malware attack, but implementing these five layers will make that risk vanishingly small. Layer number one is backing up your data. Let's imagine for a moment that this box represents your computer system, and these gold bars represent all of the valuable things that you keep on your computer. Personal information, photographs, music, and other things like that. In most cases, it's easy to make backup copies of digital property. Digital storage is cheap, so it's a good idea to make copies of your important files and to keep those copies somewhere away from your computer. Somewhere safe. That way, even if your computer is compromised by some sort of malware infection, you'll still have your backup files to fall back on. You have several options for making backups of your data. Some of the most popular include removable disks, such as CDs and DVDs, removable flash memory devices, such as thumb drives, external hard drives, and, of course, web-based cloud storage services. Any of these could be an excellent choice depending on your personal storage needs. Layer number two is using a firewall. Let's say that once again this box represents your computer system, this cloud represents the internet, and this friendly face represents all of the millions of friendly people, machines, and organizations that you can interact with on the internet. Normally, you send your information or your requests for information out to these friendly entities, and they send back information or web pages of their own. This is normally a benign transaction. But not everybody on the internet is friendly. Some of them are out to attack other users. This skull will represent those attackers who wish to place malware onto other people's computers. Now this situation raises an important question. If we can send information to other computers on the internet, and if other people can send information back to our computers, What's to stop the bad guys from sending malicious information straight into our computers and leaving us with a nasty malware infection? The answer is that there's a layer of defense between your computer and the internet. This layer is called a firewall. Firewalls may be either hardware devices, software programs, or both. In either case, firewalls are responsible for screening the information that comes and goes from your computer. Firewalls block information coming into your computer from the outside. When you send out a request for information, the firewall keeps track of where you sent that request. When you get a response from that entity, the firewall lets the information back through to your computer. But if somebody tries to send unrequested information directly into your computer, the firewall will block it. You should be aware of two important limitations inherent in firewalls. First. A firewall cannot help you if you request information from a malicious source. If you initiate contact with a malware attacker, then your firewall might let a piece of malware right back onto your computer. The second limitation is that firewalls are never perfectly foolproof. It's relatively uncommon for attackers to send unrequested malware through or around firewalls, but it does happen every now and again. Despite these limitations, firewalls are an indispensable cybersecurity tool. You should be sure that you're running a firewall whenever your computer is connected to the internet. Layer 3 is installing software patches. When malware programmers design malware to attack your computer, they're generally attacking the software that runs on your computer. All software has security weaknesses, even if we don't know what they are yet. That's why we're using a dotted line to represent the boundary around your computer, to emphasize that there are gaps. Malware attacks must exploit one of these software weaknesses in order to succeed. Many malware attacks are unsuccessful. We may never even know that they occurred because they failed to exploit a weakness. For example, malware that is written for PCs will be ineffective against users who use Mac computers because Macs and PCs have different weaknesses. But malware programmers are constantly searching for security weaknesses in popular software. When they find them, they write new malware that exploits those weaknesses. 
but legitimate software developers are also constantly searching for security weaknesses in their products. When they find them, they release security updates called patches. Patches cover the known weaknesses in a program so that attackers can't exploit them. This is why it's important to install software updates for your computer whenever they become available. Layer 4 is using antivirus software. In the world of cybersecurity, antivirus software functions kind of like a guard dog. A dog can learn to detect people and to distinguish between people based on the way that they smell. Similarly, Antivirus software can detect and distinguish between good and bad software based on the lines of code present in that software. When antivirus software detects a line of code associated with a known malware threat, it takes action. Antivirus software can alert you to the presence of malware, sometimes before your computer is even infected. It's kind of like a guard dog who begins barking when intruders approach its territory. Antivirus software can also recognize malware attacks and block them, kind of like a guard dog that attacks an intruder before he enters the house. And if you do get a malware infection on your computer, antivirus software can sometimes remove it for you, like a guard dog who chases an intruder out of your house. Of course, antivirus programs aren't perfect. There will always be a few strains of malware that they're unable to detect, and many people find that certain antivirus programs slow down their computers. But we still recommend that you run an antivirus program on your computer and make sure that the program is up to date so that it can smell the most recent malware threats. Layer number five is user education. So far, we have focused mainly on your computer, but we think it's important to also focus on you, the user. You are, after all, the person who is under attack, and we'd like to discourage the idea that you're just a passive participant in cybersecurity. It's better to think of yourself as an active participant, and the more you learn about cybersecurity, the more purposefully you can act. Furthermore, the better you understand cybersecurity, the better you will be at distinguishing friend from foe in the first place, and the better you will be at recognizing the tactics that malware attackers will use to get malware onto your computer. So that's our fifth level of defense. Users should arm themselves with knowledge. If you're watching these videos, then you're on the right track. Okay, that's all I have for you for now on malware defense. To review, we covered five layers of defense. Backing up data, using a firewall, installing software patches, using antivirus software, and user education. None of these layers is very effective on its own, but taken together, they constitute a strong cyber defense strategy. In the next video, we'll begin discussing web browsing, and we'll talk about some of the security issues that users face when they're surfing the web. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 19, How Web Browsing Works. In this lesson, I'll show you a few illustrations that depict the way that your computer interacts with the web. This information will be useful background information in later lessons when we discuss tips for safely browsing the web. Some of you may be watching this video as part of a course that uses this textbook. If you are, you should know that the illustrations we're going to examine here are all in Chapter 7. If you aren't using this textbook, then don't worry about it. Just follow along with the lesson. Let's take a look at the first illustration. It depicts some of the primary ways that your computer interacts with the web. Let's start over on the left side of the illustration. This largest box represents your whole computer. In your computer, there's an application called a web browser that allows you to interact with the web. Popular web browsers include Firefox, Chrome, Safari, and Internet Explorer, but there's other options out there as well. One of the primary functions of a web browser is to request and display web pages for the user. That function is represented by the green box that says HTML Viewer. What is HTML exactly? HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and it's the primary code used for writing web pages. 
We'll look at HTML a little more closely later in this lesson. For now, all you have to see is that web browsers translate web pages from HTML code into graphical displays that we can see on our computer monitors. Web browsers contain many other functions besides simple HTML display capabilities. Your browser probably has a PDF viewer so that it can display PDF files. It may also have a Flash plugin, which allows it to view a variety of online animations written in Flash. Browsers have many more applications like this that allow them to take advantage of the diverse capabilities of the web. In this illustration, these applications are all lumped together into the green box labeled Internal Executables. Your web browser is also linked to other applications on your computer, not just internal applications on the web browser. For example, your web browser might detect a song or a video that's embedded in a web page, and so it might automatically access a media player from your computer so that it can view that media on the web. Your web browser also has access to a couple different kinds of data storage. One kind of data storage is called a cache. Cache helps a web browser to load web pages more quickly. When a web browser loads a web page for the first time, it has to download all of the data from the web server so that it can display it for the user. Web browsers will keep some of this data in cache storage so that the next time the user needs to access the web page, it will load more quickly. It already has some of the data in storage. Another kind of storage is the general file storage for your computer, such as the storage space available on your hard drive. Your web browser can download documents and applications from the web, and it can store those documents and applications in the storage space on your computer. And then you can open or execute those files later without being connected to the internet or even having your web browser open. Now let's start working our way over to the right. There's a red arrow connecting the web browser to the web server. This arrow is labeled HTTP. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. HTTP is the communications protocol, that is the communications rules used for communicating HTML code. Now, you may remember, in an earlier lesson I said that computers communicate across the internet using a set of rules called Internet Protocol, or IP. Now, you might be wondering, well, which is it, IP or HTTP? Technically, the answer is that computers need to use both IP and HTTP in order to access web pages. IP is necessary for communicating anything at all across the internet, whether it be a web page or something else. But HTTP is an additional protocol that's only necessary to communicate web pages. As you can see in the illustration, the HTTP arrow runs both ways. HTTP defines the rules for your web browser to communicate with the web servers, and it also defines the rules for the web servers to communicate back with your web browser. Moving further to the right, this diagram includes a web server. The web server is a storage computer that's located somewhere else on the internet. It's a remote computer containing a document called a web page, and your web browser is the application that allows you to access the web page from your computer. In this illustration, it kind of looks like your computer has a direct connection to the web server, but remember that that's not really the case. Between your computer and the web server is the whole internet, a vast system of networking devices. The web server contains web pages, and web pages contain two different kinds of content, static content and dynamic content. What's the difference between static content and dynamic content? The main difference between the two is how interactive they are. Static content is less interactive. It stays the same every time you access it, regardless of what you do with it. Text and photos are examples of static content. Text and photos are often meant to stay the same for every user who accesses them. Dynamic content, on the other hand, is interactive. It's usually some kind of interactive program embedded in the web page. Because it's interactive, dynamic content is potentially different each time you access it. A good example of dynamic content is a restaurant's web page that lets you build and order your own burrito online. Okay, that illustration gives you an idea of how your web browser interacts with web pages. Now let's take a closer look at the HTML code that web pages are written in. Here on the left, we have a simple web page. And over on the right, that's the source HTML code for this web page. That source code is what gets stored in the web server. Your web browser accesses that code, 
and it interprets and displays the code for you in a page resembling the one here on the left. For this particular web page, the first six lines of code are setup code that gives the browser information about the web page. There isn't much in these first six lines that's particularly important for us right now. I will briefly mention two things though. First, for this web page, the setup code is only six lines long, but for most professionally built web pages that you would interact with on a daily basis, there would be a lot more code than you see here. This is just an example. Second, I want to point out that the title of the web page is written between these two title tags here. Notice that the title is what is displayed in the tab on your web browser. Technically speaking, the title of a web page is this text that's displayed in the tab on your web browser. So, if you're ever trying to cite a web page for a paper, now you know where you can find the official title of a web page. Let's move down to the code contained between these two body tags. The code between these two tags defines what the bulk of the web page looks like. We can see a heading at the top of the web page that reads sample web page, and if we look over at the code, we see that the heading corresponds to the information between these H3 tags. Everything else on the web page is contained between a series of P tags. In web coding, P tags like this define paragraphs. A new P tag tells the browser to skip down a line and begin displaying a new paragraph of content. As we can see, each P tag here corresponds in order with another line of content over on the web page. Now, I want to show you two significant features of HTML that have security implications for you and me. The first is the difference between local images and remote images. You see, if you build a web page in HTML, one option is for you to upload your own images for the web page onto the same server where you're uploading all of the other HTML code. These are called local images. This first picture of a fish is a local image. The person who built this web page uploaded this image to the web himself or herself. However, HTML also has the ability to display images from other web pages in your web page. This isn't always legal, depending on how you use other people's images, but in principle, it's very easy to define a remote image from another web page as the image to be displayed on your web page. This second picture of a fish happens to be a remote image. Somebody else uploaded it to a different web page, but whoever built the web page that we're looking at has written the code so that it will take this image from somewhere else on the web and display it here. If you look over at the HTML code for this web page, you can see the web address where this picture is being hosted. If you are just looking at the web page, you can't tell whether an image is local or remote. You have to view the source code to make that distinction. So how is the distinction between local and remote images significant for cybersecurity? Well, some cyber criminals will build fake web pages that are intended to look like web pages from your bank or another trusted institution. They may use remote images from the trusted institution's web page to make their counterfeit web page look exactly like the original. You can't really tell that an image is from a remote source if you just look at the page itself, but if you learn some basics of HTML, it's not very difficult to check if a suspicious web page is relying on remote images like this one. All web browsers will allow you to view a web page's source code, so in theory you could check for remote images on any web page. Let's look at one more feature of HTML that is relevant to cybersecurity. In HTML, it's extremely easy to lie about the destination of hyperlinks. Here, you can see the title of a hyperlink in black. That's the part that gets displayed on the web page. Over here in blue, you can see the actual web destination of each hyperlink. So this particular link is labeled dishonestly. It claims to navigate to CNN.com but really it takes you to www.dougj.net. Criminal web pages and also scam emails will frequently contain misleading hyperlinks like this. They're designed to trick you into visiting malicious web pages that you wouldn't normally visit. The good news is that web browsers will tell you where a hyperlink really navigates to. All you have to do is hover the mouse button over the hyperlink without clicking on it. A small box should pop up somewhere on the browser window, and it will tell you where the link will really take you. 
Okay, that's all for now. In the next lesson, we'll continue discussing security topics that are relevant to web browsing. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 20, Safely Navigating the Web. In this lesson, we'll discuss four web safety issues, handling files on a web browser, accepting cookies from websites, using a more secure version of HTTP called HTTP Secure or HTTPS, and keeping and deleting a web browser's history. Safe browsing issue number one is handling files. Some of you may be watching this video as part of a course that uses this textbook. If you are, you should know that we're about to examine some illustrations from Chapter 7 of this book. If you aren't using the book, then don't worry about it, just follow along with the lesson. This diagram shows how Alice's computer interacts with files from the web. If you understand how a web browser interacts with files from the web, then you will stand a better chance of avoiding malware from the web. Let's examine this diagram beginning on the right side of the page. Web pages are a type of electronic document and they are stored on remote computers called web servers. Your computer accesses web pages on web servers through the internet. The red line in this image represents the internet connection between Alice's computer and the web server. Now, you may remember that when computers communicate, they can only understand each other if they stick to a strict set of communications rules, and these rules are called a protocol. The web browser on Alice's computer and the web server are using a protocol called Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP. Web browsers and web servers almost always use HTTP to communicate with each other. The most common exception to this rule is that some web pages use an encrypted version of HTTP called Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, or HTTPS. We'll talk about HTTPS a little more later in this lesson. For now, I just want you to see that when you browse the web, your web browser and a web server somewhere are trading information back and forth using some version of HTTP. When your browser sends out a request for information, the web server will normally return some web page that you have asked for. The web page itself is coded in a programming language called Hypertext Markup Language, or HTML. A major component of the web browser, then, is the HTML interpreter, which allows the web browser to decode and display web pages that are written in HTML. In this image, notice that Alice's whole web browser is represented by a red box and the HTML interpreter part of her browser is represented by a smaller black box within the web browser. The HTML interpreter is part of the web browser, but the web browser does more than just decode and display web pages written in HTML. When the HTML interpreter reads through the lines of code for the web page, it will occasionally find non-HTML files embedded into the HTML code. For example, it might find a video file or a PDF embedded into the web page. Videos, PDFs, and other embedded files aren't written in HTML code, so the HTML interpreter cannot display these files without some help. Alice's web browser has several plugins, that is, several helper applications that are programmed into the web browser itself to help it to interpret non-HTML files that are embedded into web pages. In this image, we see that Alice's web browser has three kinds of plugins. Executable plugins run programs embedded into web pages, programs written in coding languages like JavaScript. Document plugins allow Alice to view documents, such as PDF files, straight from her web browser. Viewer plugins allow Alice to view or listen to other image, audio, video, or graphics files from her web browser. Sometimes, Alice's web browser will encounter a file embedded in the HTML of a web page that it's not able to interpret with either its HTML interpreter or with any of the other plugins that it has available. When this happens, the web browser might ask a helper application located somewhere else on Alice's computer to open the file. Alternatively, Alice might choose to download a file from a web page. When she does this, the file is downloaded onto her computer. 
normally someplace on her hard drive, and she can open that file later, even if she is disconnected from the web server or from the internet altogether. So, as you can see, Alice's web browser encounters a number of different file types, and it can handle those file types in a number of different ways. As a user, Alice has some control over how her web browser handles files that are embedded into web pages. Let's imagine for a moment that Alice uses the Firefox web browser. If Alice opens the Options window in Firefox and selects the Applications tab, she can control what action her browser takes when it encounters any given type of file. For example, she can control whether the web browser will execute the file automatically or if it will ask for permission first. In this illustration, we see that Alice's web browser is set up to automatically open several file types with Adobe Acrobat. We can also see that Alice's browser is set up to open various audiovisual files automatically with a QuickTime plugin, which is also located in her browser. However, whenever her browser encounters a compressed folder, it will ask for permission to open it or to save the file. Alice doesn't want her browser to automatically open or to automatically save compressed files. She wants to process those files manually. This next illustration shows how Alice can change the way that her computer handles files. In Firefox, she clicks on the bar displaying the action for a given file type, and a menu drops down with several options. She can command the browser to always ask her how to handle a given file type, or she can command it to always save a given file type to a particular location, or she can command the browser to always open the file. Her browser is recommending that she always open Microsoft Word documents using Microsoft Word. But if Alice prefers a different word processing software, she can specify that a different program besides Word handle these files. Alice can adjust these settings for any file type that she might encounter in her browser. So what should you do? Should your browser automatically open files embedded in web pages, or should it ask you for permission first? Now, obviously, the most convenient option is to allow the web browser to just automatically process files. If it's automatic, then you don't have to think about it. But because some files might contain malware, automatically executing all files is also the most insecure option. The best thing for security is to pick and choose manually which files your computer opens. You will have to strike a balance between security and convenience based on your own computing habits and your own needs. Do you encounter a lot of files from unknown sources? If so, you probably want to screen those files. But do you stick to relatively few, familiar, and trusted web pages? Then maybe for convenience sake, you could allow your browser to open files automatically. Now, you may not use Firefox. Or maybe you do use Firefox, but our images may have become outdated because of a recent upgrade, which is very possible given the speed at which technology develops. But no matter which web browser you use, it should allow you to control how it handles files one way or another. So do some exploring and figure out how you can do that in your web browser. Safe browsing issue number two is cookies. Cookies are small files that websites leave on your web browser. Cookies allow websites to remember users' behaviors and preferences on a given website. They enable a lot of the features that web users like. For example, cookies are what allow website to remember whether or not you're logged in with your user account. Cookies also allow shopping websites to remember what items have been placed in a user's shopping cart. Furthermore, cookies are simple text files, so they can't contain any code that would run a program, and therefore they cannot execute malware infections on your computer. So cookies are great for convenience, and they are malware-free. But cookies have a downside, too. One particular kind of cookie, called a tracking cookie, can track user activity across the internet. Many users feel like tracking cookies are a violation of privacy. For example, if you shop for baseballs on baseballgear.com on Monday afternoon, you might notice that a new website starts showing you ads for baseball bats and gloves on Monday evening. These targeted ads imply that your behaviors are being observed and shared between websites and between different companies. This is made possible by tracking cookies. Tracking cookies are ultimately all about advertising. As you can imagine, advertisements are much more valuable if they're tailored towards your personal interests. The more targeted the ads are to you, 
the more effective the ad usually is. That's why advertisers advertise toys during children's shows and beer during football games. The people who are interested in children's TV shows are statistically more likely to be interested in toys. And the same people who are interested in football games are statistically more likely to be interested in beer. Tracking cookie companies pay websites to run software that writes tracking cookies onto your browser. These tracking cookies can collect information about you on any website that runs the software by the tracking cookie company. Over time, the tracking cookie company builds a profile on the user behavior associated with your web browser, and it can use that profile to direct targeted ads to your browser. It reads the cookie, it observes your browsing behavior, and it says to itself something like this. I see that you've been reading about baseballs and buying baseballs. I guess I should show you these baseball bat advertisements because it seems likely that you're the kind of person who'd be interested in buying a baseball bat. Another issue with cookies is that they can allow users to stay signed in to online accounts on their browsers. Now, on the face of it, there's no major issue here. Why would it matter if you stayed logged in on your own private computer? Well, it only becomes a problem if somebody is allowed to snoop through your computer. For example, you might leave your computer in a public place. Or, more likely, you might leave your computer out at home during a party or a gathering. Or, if your boyfriend or girlfriend has access to your computer, then they might have automatic access to your accounts. In any of these situations, somebody else could use your active login information to access your online accounts. So although cookies are more convenient for you, keep in mind that they're also more convenient for people who snoop through your computer. And of course, if you're using a public computer, then make sure that it does not remember the password for your online accounts. You don't want people in public to log into your private accounts. One final security issue with cookies. If you are using an unsecure wireless connection, then eavesdroppers can intercept cookies sent to and from your computer. If the cookie in question happens to be an authentication cookie that's used for logging into an online account, then the eavesdropper can save this cookie and use the information on it to log into your account later. Safe browsing issue number three is HTTPS. Earlier, I mentioned that web browsers communicate with web servers using a protocol called Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP. Regular HTTP is a set of rules that governs the way that code is sent back and forth between web browsers and web servers. Regular HTTP sends code back and forth in clear text. That is, the code is easily readable for anybody who has access to it. So if somebody happens to be eavesdropping on your browsing session on an unsecured wireless network, they can easily read any information that is sent through HTTP. There is another protocol called Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, or HTTPS, that adds another step to the HTTP protocol. Instead of sending code back and forth in clear text, HTTPS adds a step of encryption. If you navigate to a web page using HTTPS, then the website encrypts all of the code that it sends to your web browser, and it gives your web browser a unique key for decrypting that code. Eavesdroppers will still be able to see your traffic on an unsecure wireless network, but if your browser and the website are communicating with HTTPS, then the traffic between them is unreadable for the eavesdropper. The eavesdropper will only intercept an encrypted mess of unreadable, garbled code. Many web pages use HTTPS for their login pages so that your login credentials are secure as they move across the internet. If you're going to submit sensitive information online, you should make sure that you're using web pages that use HTTPS. Most web browsers display the address bar differently for a web page that uses HTTP than it does for a web page that uses HTTPS. Here's what the difference looks like in Firefox. The page on top uses HTTP, and the page on bottom uses the more secure HTTPS. Notice the green padlock and security certificate on the HTTPS page. Here are the same two pages shown as they would display on Google Chrome. Again, HTTP is on top and HTTPS is on bottom. Notice once again the green security certificate and padlock icon on the HTTPS page. You should be aware that HTTPS helps to protect you from wireless eavesdropping, but HTTPS can't protect you from malicious websites. 
Not every website that uses HTTPS is necessarily safe. Bad guys can use HTTPS too. It's just that using HTTPS will protect you from wireless eavesdropping. You should still proceed with caution on websites that you do not recognize and trust, even if they use HTTPS. Safe browsing issue number four is browser history. As you probably know, your web browser normally keeps a complete record of which web pages you have navigated to. This history can be convenient. It helps you to remember things that you have read online, and it helps you to navigate to frequently accessed web pages more quickly. But like most convenient things, browsing histories trade security for convenience. Your browser won't differentiate between sensitive and non-sensitive information. It will keep a complete record of all of it. Anybody who cares to snoop through your browsing history will be able to see what you've been doing online, perhaps including where you do your banking, whose Facebook pages you have visited, or what kinds of medication you've been researching. Web browsers on public computers will normally default to recording your browsing history too. If you use a public computer, say one at a library, then practically anybody can see what you were doing after you leave the computer. There are three primary ways to control your browsing history. The first is to delete your history. Your browser should have a delete history function, and all of the most popular browsers will give you some control over what you delete. For example, Firefox will allow you to clear your history going back different amounts of time, an hour, a week, etc. And it will allow you to clear all of your history at once, or to just focus on one specific kind of information cookies, browsing history, data typed into online forms, etc. The second way to control your browsing history is to limit what kinds of information your computer gives, receives, and remembers. For example, in Firefox, you can control whether the browser remembers your browsing and downloading history. You can also control whether the browser accepts cookies and how long it retains those cookies. The third way to control your browsing history is to use the private browsing setting in your web browser. The private browsing setting normally opens up a new private browser window. When you decide to close this window, it will automatically delete all of the history and cookies that you picked up during that browsing session. When you open a regular browsing window again, your browser will default back to whatever default settings you normally use. Okay, to review, we covered four web safety issues in this lesson. Handling files, accepting cookies, HTTPS, and browsing histories. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about the most common security issues that we face when we shop online. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 21, Online Shopping. Online shopping is big business. With so much money being exchanged, it's no surprise that many criminals target online shoppers. Many of the security issues that we have discussed previously are relevant to online shoppers. In this video, we'll address 11 online shopping security issues. Avoiding malware, using strong passwords, using trusted computers, avoiding unsecure wireless networks, avoiding malicious adware, avoiding phishing websites, distinguishing legitimate retailers from illegitimate ones, using a link scanner, researching a retailer, withholding information, and finally, paying with plastic. Online shopping issue number one is avoiding malware. In previous lessons, we talked about how to protect yourself from a number of different kinds of malware. Viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and bots. Some malware attacks are directed specifically at online shoppers. So, before you shop online, it's a good idea to make sure that you're employing the defense in depth strategy outlined in lesson 18 of this series. Do you remember what that strategy entails? Back up your data, 
run a firewall, make sure that your software patches are all up to date, run antivirus software, represented here by a guard dog that blocks viruses from getting into a computer, and be an educated user, somebody who knows the old threats, but who also keeps up with new threats as they appear in the news. I won't say much more about these layers of defense here. If you would like to review them in more detail, you can go ahead and rewatch Lesson 18 in this series, which is titled Layers of Defense Against Malware. Online shopping security issue number two is using strong passwords. Online shopping accounts are sensitive accounts. Many of them grant users access to your credit card information. They also usually have a shipping address on file, which would tell somebody where you live. And because they might keep a record of your purchases, these accounts also give users an idea of how much money you spend and what kinds of valuables you might have in your house. So it's important to use a strong password if you set up an online account with a retailer. Strong passwords make it more difficult for cyber criminals to compromise your shopping accounts. Lesson 11 gave you advice for creating strong passwords. Rather than rehash all of that advice here, I'm going to refer you back to that lesson. Online shopping security issue number three is using trusted computers. Refrain from doing your online shopping or from divulging any financial information at all on untrusted computers, especially on public computers. It's relatively easy for a cyber criminal to install key loggers onto a computer. A keylogger can record all of the keystrokes that you make on a computer, and so it picks up things like usernames, passwords, and credit card information that you plug into a website. Furthermore, there are other kinds of spyware that could potentially lurk on untrusted computers. You don't want anybody spying on your financial transactions, so stick to private computers that you trust. Online shopping security issue number four is unsecure wireless networks. We have already discussed some of the dangers of unsecured wireless networks, and we will discuss them in even more detail in upcoming lessons. One of the main security issues that comes along with unsecured wireless networks is wireless sniffing, which is the practice of intercepting information traveling between a computer and a wireless router. Because of these dangers, it's best not to shop on unsecured wireless connections. Online shopping security issue number five is malicious adware. In lesson 16, we touched on the dangers of malicious adware. We explained that many advertisements are legitimate, but some advertisements aren't. Malicious advertisements try to trick people into clicking on them. And then those advertisements direct people to a malicious website, such as a phishing website or a website containing a drive-by download. So be shrewd. If an ad presents an offer that's too good to be true, then it's probably not a legitimate offer. Before you click on any ads, always hover your mouse arrow over the link to check the URL that the link navigates to. If an advertisement says that it's taking you to, say, an Amazon or an eBay affiliated webpage, but then the URL it displays is not from Amazon.com or eBay.com, then you should not click on the advertisement. In fact, it's a good idea not to ever shop on a web page that you navigated to through clicking on a hyperlink. It's better to type the retailer's URL into the address bar for yourself. This will give you an added layer of assurance that you're shopping where you want to shop. Online shopping security issue number six is phishing websites. In lessons 10 and 14, we touched on the dangers of phishing. Phishing is a trick where a cyber criminal tries to convince a victim to divulge his or her sensitive information, such as usernames, passwords, or bank routing numbers. We examined a phishing email which claimed to be from Chase Bank, but which really contained links to a website that was intended to steal users' banking information. Cyber criminals will do the same trick with online retailers. They will send out emails containing links to fake retail web pages that are intended to trick you into divulging login information or banking information. Here's an example of a phishing email claiming to offer popular products at deep, deep discounts, which are well below market value. If you get emails like this, just delete them. 
they are probably phishing emails. Legitimate businesses won't discount their goods 80 or 90% from market value. Successful companies don't become successful by losing money on every single sale that they make. Online shopping security issue number seven is distinguishing legitimate retailers from illegitimate ones. How can you tell the difference between a legitimate and an illegitimate retailer? I just mentioned that some illegitimate retailers will claim to sell popular high demand goods for incredible discounts, but there are other cues to look for when assessing a retailer. Here's the homepage for a fictional retailer, lowlowprices.com. Let's pretend for a minute that low low prices is a real legitimate retailer. How could you be sure that this is the real homepage for low low prices? One obvious cue is to check the URL up in the address bar. If you wish to shop at lowlowprices.com, but the URL says something different, like lowlowprices.cn, then you should suspect that the page that you're on is a counterfeit. Another cue to look for is HTTPS. Legitimate retailers should always use HTTPS to log you into your account or to accept payments. Any website that does not use HTTPS for these functions is unsafe and probably malicious. Now, some malicious websites will go so far as to use HTTPS. What this means is that the presence of HTTPS is not a foolproof assurance that the website is trustworthy. However, you can take the absence of HTTPS as an assurance that the website is not trustworthy. Even if a retailer has only good intentions, if they don't use HTTPS, especially for logging in and for accepting payments, you know immediately that they're not using adequate security practices. Stay away from such retailers. Another cue to look for is whether a retailer asks for too much information. For example, retailers don't need to know your social security number to complete a transaction. If they ask for it, there's a good chance that they are up to no good. Online shopping security issue number eight is using a link scanner. One tool that can help you to shop more safely is a link scanner. So what's a link scanner? Link scanners are applications that you can add onto your web browser. Link scanners check hyperlinks against a security database, and they tell you if there's any known security issues with the web pages associated with each hyperlink. There are several link scanners to choose from. One popular example is Web of Trust. Web of Trust displays color-coded circles next to hyperlinks. These circles tell you whether or not the web page has a good security reputation. For example, I have Googled the phrase Iowa State University Information Security. Web of Trust has marked each of the top five hits with a green circle. This tells us that these links have a good security reputation. Of course, this isn't an absolute guarantee. Web of Trust is capable of making mistakes. But the green circle is a strong indicator that the website is probably trustworthy. But here, I have Googled the phrase free iPad. The first hit is marked with a red circle, which means that the link is known to be untrustworthy. The second hit is marked with a gray circle, which means that Web of Trust has little or no information about this link. The website has no reputation one way or the other. The third hit is marked with a green circle, which means that Web of Trust users have reported that this web page is trustworthy. But I have to say, I'm skeptical of this particular link. First off, notice that the URL for this web page is doctorsandtobacco.org. I don't know anything about that URL, but I'm having a hard time seeing what doctors and tobacco would have to do with free iPads. We can also see from the Google preview that this page includes the sentence, everyone who participates has over 40% chance to win a free Apple iPad. That promise is obviously too good to be true, so I think common sense dictates that we should avoid this link, even though Web of Trust has marked the link as safe. If we want to learn more about a link's rating on Web of Trust, we can click on the circle next to the link. This takes us to a Web of Trust scorecard page for that link. Here, we find a clue that might explain why such a fishy looking link has a good rating from Web of Trust. We see here that Web of Trust has very low confidence in this rating. So as far as Web of Trust knows, this is a safe link. 
but Web of Trust admits that it doesn't yet have very good information on this particular link. It's possible that this link is a scam, and the scammers themselves could be the ones who gave the link such a high rating. Online shopping security issue number nine is researching a retailer. If you would like to make a purchase through a retailer that you've never used before, you should do a little research on the retailer before giving them any of your financial information. Here are some things to look for. First, their website should have a phone number. Legitimate businesses will usually have a phone number that you can call so that you can ask about their business practices. Second, the retailer should have a physical location somewhere, at least an office or a warehouse. So where are they based? If they don't have a physical location, then they're likely to be illegitimate. Third, you should look up some online reviews of the retailer. If other people have shopped there before, then some of them have probably left reviews somewhere online. Try googling them. But be careful. Sometimes scammers will write positive reviews of themselves and then post those reviews online. Online shopping security issue number 10 is withholding information. Another way to protect your sensitive information is to give retailers as little information as possible. Don't show them everything about you. Hold back as much as you can. Even if you trust a retailer, it's always a good idea to withhold as much information from them as you can. If they ask for information that's not required to make a purchase, such as your date of birth or your gender, withhold that information. In all probability, they just want that information so that they can use it to direct ads at you anyway. So there's no harm in holding it back. And if a retailer asks for your social security number, stop interacting with that retailer immediately. Social security numbers are never necessary to make a purchase. Only crooks ask for a social security number to complete a purchase. Online shopping issue number 11 is shopping with plastic. You can further protect yourself by opting to shop with a credit card instead of a debit card. There is inherently nothing more secure about credit card technology, but it's an accident of American legal history that credit cards offer better fraud protection than debit cards do. Because of the way that federal laws ended up being written over time, consumers are better protected from credit card fraud than they are from debit card fraud. As you can see in this table, both credit card users and debit card users are not liable for fraud if the fraud is reported before the stolen card is actually used. So you're safe if you notice that your credit card is missing and report it as missing before somebody else uses it. But a cardholder may be held liable if the fraud is only reported after the card is used. Users of either kind of card are only legally liable for up to $50 worth of expenses if the fraud is reported within two business days. However, there's a sharp jump after two business days for debit card users. Debit card users are legally liable for up to $500 of fraudulent charges if the fraud is reported within two to 60 business days. Credit card users though, they are still liable for only up to $50. It's worth noticing here that in either case, after 60 business days, you could be liable for unlimited amounts of fraudulent charges. Furthermore, it's a good idea to check your credit card statement and your debit card statement once a week. Now, your bank or your credit card company has software to help them to detect fraudulent charges. Now, this is convenient for you, but it's still important for you to monitor your own debit and your own credit card accounts. Criminals know that banks and consumers are more likely to notice large, conspicuous purchases, so sometimes they'll try to limit themselves to smaller, less noticeable purchases so that they can use the stolen card for a long time before anybody notices. So check your statements for yourself, too, to make sure that your bank hasn't missed something. Okay, that's all the advice I have for you with regards to online shopping. To briefly review, we addressed 11 issues. Avoiding malware, using strong passwords, using trusted computers, avoiding unsecure wireless networks, avoiding malicious adware, avoiding phishing websites, distinguishing legitimate retailers from illegitimate ones, using a link scanner, researching a retailer, withholding information, and paying with plastic. In the next lesson, we will begin discussing a major issue in cybersecurity, that is wireless network security.
Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 22, Wireless Network Basics. In this lesson, I will introduce you to wireless networks. In later lessons, we'll talk about the security risks associated with wireless networks, and I'll suggest some ways in which you can use and administer wireless security networks more securely. But we'll start here with a few brief words on how wireless internet connections work. Wireless internet connections go by several names, Wi-Fi, Wireless Ethernet, and IEEE 802.11a, 802.11b, 802.11g, or 802.11n. For our purposes, all these describe the same thing, the wireless connections that allow your devices to connect with a wireless internet router, and through this router, to communicate with the whole internet. These types of connections are distinct from cellular internet connections, which do not have the same security risks as Wi-Fi connections. In this class, when we talk about wireless networks, we're going to stick to the traffic traveling between a Wi-Fi enabled device, normally a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone, and a wireless internet router. To be clear, the issues we're introducing are relevant to your phone when your phone is on Wi-Fi, but they probably aren't relevant to your phone when you're using your phone's mobile data connection. Operating systems for Wi-Fi enabled devices will have some kind of wireless connection manager program. For example, this illustration shows the wireless connection manager application that runs on the Windows 7 operating system. On the left side of the window, you can see a list of service set identifiers, or SSIDs. An SSID is also commonly referred to as the router's name, or the network's name. How does your computer know which wireless routers are in range at a given time? Simple. Wireless routers emit signals that broadcast their SSID. They are constantly advertising their own availability. Over on the right side of the window, we can see the signal strength for each network. Devices on Wi-Fi networks, both routers and computers, work by transmitting information through radio waves. These green bars let users know how strong the radio signal is between the router and the computer. In Windows 7, unsecure wireless networks are marked with a yellow exclamation point icon. Routers and computers have the ability to encrypt their transmissions. An encrypted signal means that, even if somebody intercepts your Wi-Fi traffic, they shouldn't be able to read it. But this yellow icon tells you that transmissions to and from this network will not enjoy such encryption. Let me repeat that. This yellow icon means that the information carried by the radio waves between the computer and the router will not be automatically encrypted. Let's see what happens when a user selects one of the networks from the list. When a user selects an SSID, the application asks whether the user wants to connect to a given network, and it reminds the user whether or not the requested network is secure. If a user chooses to connect to an unsecure wireless network, the computer should make the connection automatically. If it's a secure network, then the router will ask for a security key before allowing it to connect. If you are connected to a Wi-Fi network, it's worth remembering that all of the information that travels from your computer to the router and from the router back to your computer is transmitted via radio waves. These radio waves move out in every direction from their source. And they don't stop when they reach their intended destination. They will keep radiating out for a long ways. A wireless eavesdropper does not have to be seated between you and your router to pick up your wireless transmissions. They just need to be within the range of your Wi-Fi radio. And remember, radio waves are easy to intercept. All you need is the right kind of radio, and you can detect the waves. How far do Wi-Fi signals travel? Well, they usually go about 100 to 300 feet in every direction, depending on conditions and obstructions. To put that in perspective, here's what a 100-foot broadcast radius looks like compared to a football field. For perspective, here's what a 300-foot broadcast radius looks like. It's worth mentioning that with special equipment, people can sometimes detect Wi-Fi signals from even further away, say, about 1,000 feet. Remember that radio waves go out in every direction, including up and down. So, people who are above you in a tall building, or below you in a basement, 
may also intercept Wi-Fi signals. Okay, that's all for now. In the next lesson, we'll cover a number of wireless internet security threats that you should be aware of and that you should learn to protect yourself against. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 23, Wireless Internet Security Threats. In this lecture, we're going to introduce some of the most common security threats that wireless users have to deal with. We'll discuss the following four wireless security threats. Sniffing, rogue routers, evil twin routers, and unauthorized connections. At the beginning here, I'm going to remind you that these threats apply to Wi-Fi internet but they do not apply to mobile cellular networks, which use different technologies besides Wi-Fi. So when you're using Wi-Fi on your phone, this lesson applies, but when you're using data on your phone, it probably doesn't. Wireless security threat number one is sniffing. Have you ever seen a movie where somebody is having a private telephone conversation on a landline telephone, and then somebody else picks up a different phone somewhere else in the house and eavesdrops on that conversation? Wireless sniffing is a similar kind of eavesdropping that can happen on public, wireless internet connections. If you're in, say, a coffee shop surfing the web, a cybercriminal within range of that wireless network can use a variety of methods to intercept the signals between your computer and the wireless router. They can intercept the information that is sent from the wireless router to your computer, and they can also intercept the information that your computer sends back to the wireless router. By default, computers are configured not to sniff, but there is free and legal software that can reconfigure a computer to run in what is known as promiscuous mode. A promiscuous computer sniffs all of the wireless traffic on a network. For those of you who are watching this lesson as part of a class that uses this textbook, there's a diagram in chapter 9 that illustrates what we're talking about. We'll look at that diagram here. If you aren't using this textbook, don't worry about it, just follow along with the lesson. This illustration shows how computers normally function on a network, that is, when they're not sniffing traffic. Over on the right side of the page, we have a wireless router that has been named MSP Wireless. We also have three computers connected to this wireless network, User1, User2, and Alice's computer. The red dotted line here represents Alice's computer sending a packet of information to the router. It's requesting the homepage for CNN.com. Normally, this information goes out in all directions and is readable by every device on the network. But computers are normally configured to ignore this kind of information. So only Alice's computer and the router are actually involved in the transaction. User 1 and User 2 are configured to ignore Alice's computer's Wi-Fi traffic. Here's an illustration that shows the same situation, only one computer has been configured into promiscuous mode. When Alice submits her password, which is the word bananas, to the website that she's trying to log into, her password information is available to every device on the wireless network. User number one is still ignoring this information, which is what he or she is supposed to do. The router is still listening to this information, which is what it's supposed to do, but user number two has now turned into sniffer number one. This user is secretly observing Alice's login credentials. Alice can prevent sniffing in several ways. One is to use a secure wireless network. On a secure wireless network, all users on the network still have access to each other's internet traffic, but this traffic is encrypted so that other users aren't able to read it. Another way to prevent sniffing is to stick to websites that use HTTPS. HTTPS is a set of communication rules that some internet-connected devices use to communicate with each other. HTTPS encrypts all traffic between users and a given web page. Again, the traffic is still sniffable on the wireless network, but it's garbled by the encryption. Finally, users may negate sniffing by using a virtual private network or VPN. I won't go into the details of VPNs here, but Suffice it to say that VPNs are another method of internet encryption that renders internet traffic unreadable to all but designated members of a network. So, in short, the solution to sniffing is encryption. All three of these techniques are different ways of encrypting wireless traffic. 
the radio waves that carry your wireless internet signal will always be out in the public airspace for anybody to intercept. But if your data is encrypted, it will be meaningless and useless to those potential sniffers. Wireless security threat number two is rogue routers. A rogue router is an illegitimate router. Attackers set up rogue routers so that they can prey on casual internet users who connect to those routers. A cyber criminal might come along and set up a rogue router anywhere where people expect there to be free Wi-Fi. So, for example, airports are popular locations for rogue routers. Attackers will give the rogue routers plausible names, like free airport Wi-Fi, so that they can attract users to connect to them. But once users are connected, the attackers simply use those rogue routers to sniff the wireless traffic on them. They might even ask users to set up user accounts for the network, and in this way, the attackers try to snatch usernames, passwords, and other identification information from unwitting users. In fact, because some airports charge for Wi-Fi, some attackers will even go so far as to charge users to work on the rogue routers. Users will pay these fees because they were expecting to pay a fee anyway, so the victims are charged a fee to be cyber-attacked. Rogue routers are particularly tricky at travel hubs like airports and bus stations. In those situations, travelers are vulnerable. They have little time and very few resources to spend on their own cyber defense. Furthermore, the attackers that set up routers in transportation hubs may also be travelers themselves. They might not live anywhere near the place that they're attacking, and after a couple of hours of sniffing and fishing, they might simply hop on a plane and fly to the next targeted airport. But although rogue routers are particularly nasty at travel hubs, they are by no means limited to travel hubs. Rogue routers might appear anywhere where you would expect to find a potential cluster of wireless networks. Maybe coffee shops, public squares, apartment buildings, or other places like that. So you might be thinking, gee, it sounds like any public router could be a rogue router. And it's certainly possible. Between rogue routers and unsecured networks, public Wi-Fi connections can be pretty dicey. Now this isn't to say that you should avoid them entirely, but you should definitely proceed with caution anytime you connect to a public Wi-Fi network. Wireless security threat number three is evil twin routers. A close relative to the rogue router is the evil twin router. Like a rogue router, an evil twin router is a router that has been set up for the purpose of attacking users. With an evil twin router, cyber criminals take advantage of people who allow their computers to automatically connect to a public network. For example, a college or university might have a campus-wide wireless internet connection named University Wi-Fi. Routers connecting to that network are probably installed in strategic locations all across campus. Attackers will sometimes set up alternate routers with the exact same name as a known legitimate network. So if your computer is set up to automatically connect to their network named Library Wi-Fi, it will connect to whatever router it finds with that name. If there's more than one router with that name, it will connect to the one with the strongest signal. If the evil twin router happens to be the strongest connection from where you're working, your computer might automatically connect to the evil twin router without you knowing it. Once you're connected to the evil twin router, you are susceptible to all of the familiar attacks, especially wireless sniffing. Wireless security threat number four is unauthorized connections. So far, we have discussed wireless networks from the perspective of a user who is connecting to a publicly available network. Now let's consider an important security issue that comes up for wireless router owners who manage their own wireless networks at home. This issue is unauthorized connections. If you have an unsecure wireless network at home, you leave your home network open to unauthorized connections by neighbors or anybody else within the broadcast radius of your router. This practice of connecting to unsecured wireless networks without the owner's permission is sometimes called piggybacking. In many cases, piggybacking is more of a nuisance than a threat. That's because having extra users connected to your router can slow down your internet connection. But there can be other costs associated with piggybacking as well. Financial costs, security costs, and legal costs. You could incur financial costs from piggybacking if your internet plan includes a monthly limit on the amount of data that you can download or upload. If you have a data limit, then you probably don't want to unknowingly share your internet connection with piggybackers, such as neighbors or people parked on the street near your home. There can also be security costs to piggybacking. 
unauthorized network users might be able to access your router's settings and change them to make your network less secure. And as per usual, you have to consider the possibility of sniffing attacks from other users connected to the network. Perhaps most importantly, there are potential legal consequences to piggybacking. If somebody connects to the internet from your router, then all of their online activity can be traced back to your network. Any illegal activities that they participate in, such as uploading or downloading malware, pirating media, or downloading illegal pornography, will appear to be happening in your home. For example, back in 2011, the FBI raided the home of a man in Buffalo, New York, on the suspicion that he was downloading child pornography. The ensuing investigation eventually revealed that a neighbor had used the man's unsecure wireless connection to download the pornography. So fortunately, in this case, the innocent man didn't get into serious trouble, but his unsecure wireless network made him a suspect in a very serious criminal investigation that could have had dire consequences if he hadn't been vindicated. Even if your neighbors are all good, trustworthy people, it still pays to secure your home wireless network. Some cyber criminals drive around neighborhoods looking for unsecure networks that they can exploit. Okay, let's review. We've introduced four wireless security threats. Sniffing, rogue routers, evil twin routers, and unauthorized connections. All of these threats are relevant to Wi-Fi internet connections but they don't necessarily apply to mobile cellular networks. In the next lesson, we'll discuss public Wi-Fi connections and talk a little more about what you can do to use them safely. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is lesson 24, using public wireless networks. In the last lesson, we looked at a few examples of wireless security threats. With these threats in mind, I want to suggest some tips that will help you to use public wireless internet connections more securely. These tips are to refrain from using unsecure network connections for private business, to obscure your computer screen and keyboard, to know whether your connection is secure, to use websites that use HTTPS, and to use a virtual private network, also known as a VPN. Wireless security tip number one is to refrain from using public networks for private business. It can be difficult to tell whether a public Wi-Fi connection is legitimate. Sometimes users think they're connecting to a legitimate network, but they're really connecting to an evil twin router or a rogue router either of which could allow a cyber criminal to sniff one's internet traffic. The simplest, most effective solution to this problem is to refrain from using public networks for private business. Save your private business, like banking, shopping, or anything that requires you to submit login credentials, for a time when you can connect to a secure private network. We recognize that this is not always the most convenient solution, but by limiting your activity on public networks, you significantly lower your chances of being attacked. Wireless security tip number two is to obscure your computer screen and your keyboard. Peeking over somebody's shoulder is a pretty low-tech cyber attack, but it can be an effective one. Cyber criminals will position themselves so that they can see a user's computer and they'll watch the screen or they could watch the keyboard and observe private information like passwords or account numbers as they're typed. You might be surprised how proficient some people are at watching and reading your keystrokes. So when you use the internet in public, be aware of your surroundings. Position yourself so that it's difficult to see your device and pay attention to people as they change seating around you. If possible, try to stake out a seat against a wall to prevent people from sitting behind you. Wireless security tip number three is to know whether your connection is secure. You should know whether you're using a secure or unsecure wireless network. Your operating system should tell you whether or not you're connecting to a secure wireless network. For example, the Windows 7 operating system will list your available wireless connections in a frame that looks like this. Unsecure wireless connections will display a small yellow warning icon. Secure connections will display no warning 
and if you try to connect to them, they should require you to enter a security key. If the network is unsecure, you should probably avoid using it to do any private business. If the network is secure, then it's still possible for anybody else connected to the network to intercept your Wi-Fi signal, but that signal will be encrypted, and therefore it will be more difficult to interpret. So figure out how your device indicates whether or not wireless connections are secure, and always be aware of whether or not you're connecting to a secure network. Wireless security tip number four is to use websites that use HTTPS. When computers communicate with each other, they have to stick to a very strict set of communication rules. These sets of rules are called protocols. When your computer communicates with a web server over the internet, they use a protocol called HTTP, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. HTTP is designed to transmit web code back and forth between computers in clear, easily readable text. However, there's another version of HTTP called HTTPS, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. With HTTPS, all traffic between your computer and a web server is encrypted. This means that even if somebody intercepts the signal somewhere between your computer and the web server, it will be unreadable to them. Many websites use HTTPS for their login pages so that your login credentials are secure as they move across the internet. If you're going to submit sensitive information online, you should make sure that you're using a web page that uses HTTPS. Most browsers display the address bar differently for a web page that uses HTTP than it does for a web page that uses HTTPS. Here's what the difference looks like on Firefox. The page on top uses HTTP, and the page on bottom uses the more secure HTTPS. Notice the green padlock and security certificate on the HTTPS page. Here are the same two pages shown as they would display in Google Chrome. Again, HTTP is on top, and HTTPS is on bottom. Notice once again the green security certificate and padlock icon on the HTTPS page. You should be aware that HTTPS helps to protect you from eavesdropping, but HTTPS can't protect you from malicious websites. Not every website that uses HTTPS is safe. It's just that using HTTPS will protect you from wireless eavesdropping. Wireless security tip number five is to use a virtual private network or VPN. Not everybody uses a VPN or even has access to one, but for people who do, a VPN is a strong privacy and security tool. Let's take a look at how VPNs work. Here, we have a computer on a wireless network that wants to connect to a web server through the internet. We'll use blue arrows here to indicate that, for whatever reason, none of the connections between these devices are encrypted. So, unencrypted traffic might start with the computer, travel to the wireless router, travel through the twists and turns of the internet, and end up at a web server. And then the web server might send a response back to the computer. None of this will necessarily be encrypted. But now let's imagine that this is happening on a VPN. A VPN creates an encrypted connection between your computer and some other private network. This private network might be a home network, or it could be something else like a corporate network that you use at work. A VPN lets you connect privately to this network even if you're on some other network somewhere else in the world. We'll use red arrows to indicate that the connections between these points are encrypted. All of your web traffic on a VPN gets relayed through the private network. So if the computer on the left wanted to communicate with the unsecure web server at the top of the screen, it would do so through the secure connection with the private network. So all of the internet traffic starting at the computer would be encrypted. This encrypted traffic would remain encrypted as it moved across the internet to the private network. Then the private network relays the traffic to wherever it's supposed to go. At this point, it may become unencrypted the web server would send its response back to the private network. The private network would encrypt the response and send it back to the user on the left side of the screen. To use a VPN, you need special VPN software to create the encrypted connection between your wireless device and a trusted private network. Some people create VPNs using their own home networks, 
Others pay VPN services for access to large, for-profit VPN networks. A few people use VPNs to connect to their workplace networks when they're out of the office. VPNs do a good job of protecting users from wireless sniffing. But remember that a VPN can't protect users from people looking over their shoulders. Neither will they protect you if you connect to a malicious website. However, if you simply must perform private business over a public Wi-Fi connection, then the safest way to do so is to use a VPN. Okay, let's review. We've covered five tips for safer browsing on public wireless networks. These five tips were to refrain from using public networks for private business, to obscure your computer screen and keyboard so people can't watch what you're doing, to know whether your connection is secure, to use websites that use HTTPS, and to use a virtual private network or VPN. In the next video, we will discuss some security topics for wireless network administrators, especially people who administer a home wireless network. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 25, Administering Wireless Networks. Many of you probably have your own wireless networks in your own homes. The primary security threat for home Wi-Fi networks is unauthorized access, sometimes called piggybacking. If somebody accesses your wireless network without you knowing it, they can potentially sniff your wireless traffic while you're using your devices at home. Perhaps even worse, they could use your internet connection to commit cybercrimes, such as fraud or buying and selling drugs. Such activities could be traced back to your router. Attackers know this. Some of them even drive around neighborhoods looking for unsecured wireless connections. Sometimes, when cybercriminals find good, accessible, unsecure connections, they will post them on online maps that direct a criminal community towards good places to access unsecure Wi-Fi. Knowing these potential threats, it's a good idea to keep your wireless network secure. In this lesson, we'll cover six network administration tips that can help you to keep your wireless network as secure as possible. Use a strong router password. Enable wireless security encryption. Enable router firewalls. Disable SSID broadcast. Filter MAC addresses. And turn off your router. Network administration tip number one is to use a strong router password. To access and to change the security settings on a router, a user will type in the router's IP address into a web browser, and this address will pull up the router's administration page. The settings on this administration page are usually password protected, so that not just anybody can change the security settings on your router. Most routers come from the factory with a default password, and many users never bother to change this password. You should make sure that you've changed your router password to a strong password that you'll be able to remember. Attackers often know the default administration passwords for various routers. If they have the administration password for your router, then attackers can potentially log into your router as an administrator and then change your security settings to their liking. For guidance on choosing a strong password, I recommend that you go back and watch lesson 11, which is titled, Choosing a Strong Password. Network administration tip number two is to enable wireless signal encryption. Most routers come with some kind of security option that will allow you to encrypt the wireless radio signals between your computer and your router. Make sure that this option is enabled on your router and make sure that you're using the strongest encryption options that are available to you. The most secure encryption option currently available is called WPA2. This option won't be available on some older routers or maybe for some older computers, but if it is available, then you should use it. The next most secure encryption option is called WPA. It's a step down, but it's better than nothing. The least most secure encryption option is called WEP. Some older computers cannot read either WPA2 or WPA, and so for those computers, WEP will have to do. WEP is the weakest encryption option available, but it's still a little better than no encryption at all. Network administration tip number three is to enable router firewalls. As you may remember from other lessons, 
firewalls protect computers from receiving unauthorized and unrequested traffic through their internet connections. Your computer probably has a firewall, but your router probably also has a firewall. It's a good idea to keep your router's firewall turned on, even if you have another firewall running on your computer. There's no real downside to having multiple firewalls running at any given time, and running multiple firewalls has some advantages. Your router firewall might have strengths that cover the weaknesses of your computer's firewall. Network administration tip number four is to disable SSID broadcast. Every router has a name. A router's name is also called its service set identifier, or SSID. The SSID is the name that appears on your computer's network management application when you search for available wireless networks. Routers come factory configured so that they broadcast the SSID for everybody to see. This configuration makes sense for public internet connections, such as the one that you would find in a cafe or at an airport. It makes less sense for private internet connections in your home. If you already know the SSID that you want to connect to, then your computer can find and connect to it without the router broadcasting the SSID out to the public. Network administrators can disable SSID broadcast on a router. With this broadcast disabled, it's more difficult for outside attackers to even see whether you have a Wi-Fi connection in your house or apartment. They will likely just pass over you if you aren't broadcasting your SSID. Network administration tip number five is to filter MAC addresses. Internet-ready computers connect to the internet through a network card that plugs into the computer's motherboard. Every network card has a unique address called a Media Access Control Address, or MAC address. You should note that the word MAC in this context doesn't have anything in particular to do with MAC computers associated with Apple technologies. This resemblance is just a coincidence. Every internet-ready computer, be it a Mac, a PC, or anything else, will be associated with a unique MAC address. Most routers can filter computers by their MAC addresses. Such a feature is a powerful security tool. If this feature is enabled on your router, then only computers with approved MAC addresses can access your Wi-Fi connection. You will be able to add and to remove MAC address permissions in your router's administrative settings. Network administration tip number six is to turn off your router. It's a good idea to turn off your router if you're not going to be using it for an extended period of time. Attackers can't attack a router that's turned off. As an added bonus, you'll save a few dollars on electricity every year if you turn off your router while you're asleep or while you're away from home. Okay, let's review. We've covered six network administration tips. Using a strong router password, enabling wireless signal encryption, enabling router firewalls, disabling SSID broadcast, filtering MAC addresses, and turning off your router. That's all of the tips that I have for you for now. If you have a router, you should go play with it. See if you can adjust any of the settings that I've recommended here. If you have trouble, try searching the web for a user's manual or for a helpful form that answers your questions. Once you figure out how to access your router's administrative settings, and once you familiarize yourself with the administration page, I imagine that you'll find that the tips in this lecture are pretty easy to put into practice. In the next video, we're going to discuss some security considerations for users of social media. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 26, Social Media and Privacy. In this lecture, we're going to discuss some of the privacy issues that we encounter on social media. There are a lot of different ways that you could define privacy. So what is privacy? One helpful definition might look like this. Privacy is having control over who knows information about you, what information they know, and when they can know it. If you have a good deal of control over who knows what about you and when they know it, then most people would probably agree that you enjoy a high degree of privacy. Participation in social media always requires a sacrifice of privacy. Social media users usually show other people what they look like, who they spend their time with, what kinds of things they like to buy and to do, and what some of their opinions might be. 
on the one hand, there's nothing necessarily wrong with any of that. The whole point of a social network is to use the power of the internet to open up and to share with other people. On the other hand, the privacy trade-offs in social networking can become a problem when people share more than they thought they were sharing, or when they end up regretting something that they have shared previously. We're going to address three social media privacy issues in this lecture. Friend gluttony, copying and pasting, and employers. Social media privacy issue number one is friend gluttony. Some people strive to have as many friends or followers on social media as possible. When friending goes too far, we call this friend gluttony. On social media, members of your social network are sometimes called friends. In the real world, we usually mean something different when we talk about friends than what we mean when we talk about friends on social media. Social media friends are often people who we don't know very well. Perhaps people that we met at a party, associates who we know through a friend, or people who we haven't seen in a long, long time. In the real world, most of us wouldn't share the same kinds of private information with distant associates that we would share with our closest friends. But social media do not automatically make distinctions between close friends and non-close friends. To social media, a friend is a friend and its default settings will allow all of your friends equal access to all of the private information that you share. For this reason, it's a good idea to choose your friends wisely. Furthermore, because social media sites use words like friend, sometimes users feel like they're being unfriendly if they don't accept friend requests. Some users think, gee, if I reject a friend request, I'm saying that I dislike this person. But that's not true. All a friend rejection on social media means is that you aren't, at this time, allowing a particular person into your private network. The issue might not be that you dislike them, the issue might just be that you don't really know them that well. Why should you feel obligated to let somebody into your private network, especially if you don't know them that well? After all, it's your privacy and it's your network, so you don't have to fall into the trap of feeling obligated to friend everybody who sends you a friend request. And you don't have to feel obligated to send a friend request to everybody that you meet in person. Another trap to avoid is the trap of letting your number of social media contacts affect your sense of self-worth. Some people feel good if they have a large network, and some people feel bad if they have a small network. Such feelings lead some social media users to become friend gluttons. Now, I'm not trying to invalidate the feelings you might have about your social media presence, but I would like to caution you against participating in unsafe behaviors based on those feelings. It's okay to have a lot of friends, but you should limit your friend network to people who you have some kind of genuine relationship with. A good rule of thumb is to limit your network to people whom you feel inclined to wish a happy birthday to when their birthday comes around. If you don't like a person enough or care about them enough to take a moment to wish them happy birthday, well, then maybe you aren't close enough to that person to share your private information with them. Information such as pictures, relationship status, opinions, contact information, and maybe even your current location. Social media privacy issue number two is copying and pasting. Now, so far, I've been saying that the word friend is kind of misleading in the context of social media. I've been saying that media friends aren't always really friends, just members of your private online social network. But I should point out that a social network is only a private network in a limited sense of the word private. Once you put information out on the internet, it really isn't all that private anymore. Digital information is extraordinarily easy to copy and to share. Anybody who can see your social media profile can copy any of the text, the photos, or the information on that profile, and then share it with whomever they want. So be careful whom you add to your network, and even more importantly, be careful what you share. Privacy issue number three is employers. You should keep in mind that the things that you share on social networks could come back to haunt you later. If you're applying for jobs, you should assume that your potential employers will search for your public social media profiles before hiring you. You should make sure that any publicly viewable portions of your social media profiles represent you in the best possible light. Some social media services allow you to see your profile as it appears to different people. You can see how your page appears to the public, 
or you can choose one of your contacts or followers and check out how your profile appears to that person. You should examine your profile from several different perspectives and adjust your privacy settings so it appears how you want it to. It would also be a good idea to search for your own name with a few different search engines, Google, Bing, Yahoo, etc., just to see what kinds of information potential employers might see when they search for you. Some employers will go so far as to ask you for your social media passwords during a job interview so that they can see an unfiltered view of your private profile and private network before they make the decision to hire you. Now, some states are beginning to pass laws against such practices, but in most places, this remains a legal demand. Many of you, I'm sure, wouldn't want to share your password with your employer, so it would be a good idea to prepare a courteous refusal to such requests before you go into an interview. You could say something like, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm very cautious with private information like this. You're free to look at my public profile, but I have to keep my personal passwords to myself. If a potential employer will not accept a courteous no for an answer, then you'll have to make the difficult decision whether it's worth working for an employer like that. On the one hand, you might need the job. On the other hand, do you really want to work for somebody that doesn't respect your boundaries? Breaches of privacy on social networks can of course be embarrassing or upsetting, but they can also have severe, lasting effects on a person's career or social life. For example, in 2009, a Georgia high school teacher resigned after her district received an email complaint about content on her Facebook page. The email presented several pictures of the teacher holding alcoholic beverages while she was on vacation. The email was anonymous, but it claimed to come from a concerned parent. The teacher ended up resigning over the controversy. Since her resignation, this teacher has claimed that she had marked those vacation pictures as private, and she has also claimed that she was not friends with any of her students or with any of her students' parents. That might all be true, but still, somebody with access to her Facebook pictures clearly made copies of them and emailed them to her boss. One of her Facebook quote, friends, whomever it was, made the decision to violate this teacher's privacy by spreading these pictures beyond their intended audience. Now, I'm not trying to say that this teacher is at fault or that she deserved to lose her job over such a trivial controversy, but this episode highlights many of the privacy issues that come up with social networking. It shows that Facebook friends aren't necessarily true friends. It shows that online information is easy to copy and to share. It shows you that you never really know what somebody will consider offensive or inappropriate. And it shows that some employers are very interested in the private information that you post online. Okay, let's review. In this lesson, we discussed three social media privacy issues. Friend gluttony, copying and pasting, and issues with employers. In the next lesson, we'll discuss how these privacy trade-offs on social media can lead to trade-offs in personal security. In particular, we'll look at how burglars use social media to choose their targets, and we'll look at how some cyber attackers use social media to spread malware to users like you. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 27, Social Media and Security. In this lecture, we're going to discuss two issues of personal security that are related to the privacy trade-offs on social networks. We're going to see how some burglars use social networking to choose their victims, and we'll see how some cyber attackers use social media to spread malware to users like you. Social media security threat number one is burglars on social media. Did you know that many burglars are devoted researchers? It's true. The more a burglar knows about a target, the better judgments a burglar can make about the potential risks and rewards of burglarizing that target. There are many kinds of information that burglars research, but the most important one is this. Will anybody be home at the time of the burglary? Modern burglars are turning to social media sites to discover when residents will be out of town, as well as other information that's relevant to the burglary. 
Just imagine all the information that a clever burglar could pick up from a carelessly constructed social media profile. For example, let's consider an imaginary user named Cher. Cher posts a status update that says, Can't wait to take the kids to Cartoonland theme park for spring break. A burglar who's scanning through social media pages might stumble across this status, and so he might take a closer look at Cher's page. Scrolling through Cher's profile, he sees that she gave her husband, Floyd, a new flat screen TV for Christmas. He also sees that Floyd gave Cher a shimmering pearl necklace. Wow, antique jewels, priceless, Cher writes in the caption of the picture. The burglar also sees that Cher has two small children in elementary school. There are several pictures of the outside of Cher's house, and the burglar is able to figure out the layout of the house from the pictures. Scrolling through a few more pictures, he sees that Cher's only pet is an adorable cat named Percy, with no evidence of a guard dog. The burglar finds that Cher hasn't posted her address on any of her social media accounts. So, the burglar looks up her address in a local directory, which only takes him a few seconds. The burglar takes a few more seconds to look up the nearest elementary school, and he uses that school's academic calendar to figure out which week Cher's children will have off for spring break. He sees that spring break begins the week of April 6th, and so he checks his schedule. He finds no scheduling conflicts, and so the burglar decides to watch Cher's house on the night of April 8th, and if nobody appears to be home, to rob it on the night of April 9th. When Cher and Floyd return from their Cartoon Land theme park vacation, they find that the latch on the back window of their house has been broken. Inside, several precious items are missing, including Cher's jewelry, Floyd's flat screen TV, the kids' piggy banks, and Percy the Cat. That's an imaginary example, but real burglaries like this happen all the time. Many burglars research the houses that they burglarize, and social media makes this research much easier for them. Think about it. Could a burglar use your updates, your photos, or your location check-ins to determine how you are vulnerable or when you'll be away from home? To protect your own personal security, you should be conscious of how information that you post on social media could be used against you. When you're building a social media profile, it's a good idea to leave off the kinds of information that you normally provide when you make an online purchase or when you fill out your tax return. What kinds of information is that? I'm talking about things like your email address, your physical address, your phone number, your credit card numbers, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, PIN numbers, or any other identification information like those things. Some users won't even use their real name on social media. They'll use a nickname or a misspelling of their name, or maybe they'll use their middle name in place of their first or last name. Using a different name adds an extra layer of security to your profile. Your real friends and family will know who you are, but anonymous stalkers won't be able to find you and to identify you quite so easily. You should examine your own social media profiles, especially the parts that are visible to the public, to friends of friends, or to people on shared networks like university networks or citywide networks. When you examine your profile, try to look at it with the eyes of a burglar delete information that a burglar could use against you. You should also look at your profile through the eyes of a hacker. Look especially for any information that a hacker could use to guess the answers to security questions that you use for online profiles. As I suggested in a previous lesson, you should tell lies when you set up the answers to your security questions, because telling lies makes security questions more difficult to guess. But, if, for the sake of convenience, you decide to take the calculated risk of telling the truth on your security questions, you should remember to never accidentally post the answers to your security questions on your social media profiles. If your security question is, what is the name of your favorite pet? Don't go and post a picture of your cat on Facebook and then caption it, this is Percy, the greatest pet of all time. Some experts also recommend that you not post plain headshots of yourself online, Headshots like the ones that appear on a passport or a driver's license. Such photos could be used to make fake IDs with your picture and your name on them. And remember, as the burglary example above shows, it's a very bad idea to post location check-ins or vacation photos that tell the world when your house is unoccupied. 
Your physical location is an important piece of security information, so be thoughtful about what you reveal about your location online. Of course, the whole point of using social media is that you want to share information with other people. So if you use social media, you're obviously not going to withhold absolutely everything about yourself. But you should train your brain to think like a crook. Before you post information on social media, consider how that information could be used against you. Social media security threat number two is phishing scams and malware. Let's take a moment now to consider malware and phishing. We've already talked about both of these topics in other lessons, but now let's look at how malware and phishing scams can be aided by social media. Several malware and phishing scams are common on social networking sites. For example, a worm called Kubeface that spread on Facebook appeared in 2008. Kubeface would first appear on one's Facebook feed as a curious, strange, or enticing link, something that was apparently posted by a friend. But when a user clicked on the link, the user would be directed to a website with either a drive-by download of the Kubeface worm or with a Trojan horse that disguised the Kubeface software as a safe file download. Once a user downloaded Kubeface from either of these two methods, Kubeface would use keylogging software to steal the user's Facebook credentials. Once Kubeface discovered the user's Facebook username and password, it would hijack the user's Facebook account, and it would use that account to post more links to the malicious Kubeface website. Worms like Kubeface do not infect your computer directly through Facebook. Instead, they infect it through other web pages shared on Facebook. On Facebook and other social media services, you should be careful what you click on. You can't be sure whether or not a friend really posted something on her Facebook account unless you happen to be looking over her shoulder when she posts it. If you are remotely suspicious of something that a Facebook friend shared with you, you can just call that friend on the phone and ask them about it. You don't have to click on it. So although Kubeface uses Facebook, Kubeface isn't really native to Facebook because it directs users to outside web pages. There is another kind of software, however, that is native to Facebook that you should be careful about. And that software is applications. Be cautious with Facebook applications or any other social media applications. Applications such as games always require users to grant the application access to some of the user's profile information. Legitimate applications use this information to direct targeted advertisements toward users. That may not be pleasant, but it's generally not a security breach. There are several illegitimate applications, however, that simply harvest your information for sale, for identity theft, or for phishing scams. Illegitimate applications could take many forms, and so you should research all applications before you agree to install them or to share any information with them. And with any application that you install, it's a good security practice to withhold whatever permissions you possibly can from the application. You should also be cautious with advertisements. Scammers will sometimes use targeted ads on social media to direct users to phishing websites. If an ad tells you that you have won an amazing prize, or if it offers you a deal that's too good to be true, like a $1 iPad or airfare that's been discounted at 90% off, then you should ignore that ad. If you click on an ad like that, it will probably direct you to a phishing website, which will claim that you must enter private sensitive information in order to claim your prize. Okay, in this video, we've looked at two threats, burglars on social media and phishing and malware scams on social media. In the next lesson, we're going to discuss social engineering, which is a set of practices that scammers use to draw users like you into their scams. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 29, Reading URLs. As some of you may already know, URL is an acronym that stands for Uniform Resource Locator, and it is often used interchangeably with the term web address. And indeed, for our purposes here today, the term URL will be equivalent to the term web address. 
one place where you will encounter web addresses is in the address bar of your web browser. It's helpful to be able to read web addresses because it's the only sure way to know which web page you're actually looking at. Take this login page for example. A criminal web developer could easily make a counterfeit copy of this web page and set it up to steal your username and your password. But although criminal web developers can copy the content of legitimate web pages, as we see here, they cannot copy the URLs associated with those web pages. That's because every web page gets a unique URL. So if you can trust a URL, then you can trust the web page that's associated with it. You will also encounter URLs whenever you hover your mouse pointer over a hyperlink anywhere in your web browser. For example, in Firefox, the URL associated with a hyperlink pops up in the bottom left corner of the browser window whenever you hover over a hyperlink. The browser is telling you that clicking on this link would be the same thing as typing this URL into your browser's address bar and clicking enter. Let's click on the link. We can see that clicking on the link navigates to the URL associated with the link. So it's a good idea to learn to read URLs so that you can tell where you're going before you click on a hyperlink. This is an important security skill because a lot of cyber criminals will try to lead you to illegitimate web pages through hyperlinks in emails or pop-up advertisements or that sort of thing. Let's go back to that login page and practice reading some URLs. When you're reading a URL, the most important thing to do is to find the domain name of the URL. Why, you might ask? Because if you can trust the domain name, then you can trust the web page. The domain name is the name given to a chunk of web space owned and controlled by some entity. Nobody but the owner of a given domain name can publish web pages using that domain name. So here's how you find a domain name. First, ignore the HTTP colon slash slash bundle at the beginning of the URL. If all we're interested in is the domain name, then that bundle is irrelevant to us. Now, begin at the far left of the remaining URL, and then scan over to the right until you come to a slash. Now, count back two periods. One period, two periods. The material between the first slash and that second period back from it is the domain name. You may have noticed that my web browser, and in this case I'm using Firefox, has already highlighted the domain name for me. It's in a darker text than the rest of the URL. This is a helpful feature, but you can't always rely on your browser to highlight domain names for you. For example, in my version of Firefox, the browser does not highlight the domain name for the URL associated with a hyperlink. So let's practice finding the domain name in this hyperlink. First, we'll ignore the HTTP colon slash slash bundle at the beginning. Then, starting at the far left of the remaining URL, we scan right until we encounter a slash. Then we count back two periods. One period, two periods. The material between the first slash and that second period back from it is the domain name. Let's take a look at a couple more examples where the web designers use some different URL conventions. Here's the homepage for Iowa State University. This URL makes it very easy for us to ignore the HTTP colon slash slash bundle at the beginning because there just is no such bundle here. We would begin on the far left of the URL and scan right until we encounter a slash. But for this URL, there are no slashes. If there isn't a slash, just scan over to the end of the URL. Now count back two periods. One period, two periods. The material between the end of the URL and the second period back from it is the domain name. Let's look at one more example. Here's the homepage for longurl.org. As we just saw, when there is no HTTP colon slash slash bundle at the beginning of the URL, we just start at the far left side of the URL. Then we scan right until we encounter a slash. Then we count back two periods, one period and uh-oh, there is no second period here. If there is no second period, just stop when you run out of material entirely. In this case, the material between the first slash and the beginning of the URL constitutes the domain name. Okay, now it's your turn. 
I'm going to show you four web pages, and based on the URLs, you're going to determine which one is trustworthy. We're going to assume that the domain name iastate.edu is a trustworthy domain name, and that's because it is in real life. Here are the four web pages, and here's the domain name that you're looking for. Pause the video now and find the page with the correct domain name. Unpause whenever you're ready. Did you find it? Let's check. The first thing you must do is ignore the http colon slash slash bundle at the beginning of the URL. Then, starting at the far left of the remaining URL, scan right until you encounter the first slash. Now count back two periods. One period, two periods. The material between the first slash and the second period back from it is the domain name. So in this case, the trustworthy web page is the one on the bottom right. Let's do another exercise. Let's imagine that you bank online at something called westvalleybank.com. Now, in this case, we're using a fictional URL. I'm not aware of any real westvalleybank.com. But pretending that it is real, which of the following web pages uses that domain name? Pause the video for a moment while you figure it out. Did you find it? Let's check. The first thing you must do is ignore the HTTP colon slash slash bundle at the beginning of the URL. Since this URL doesn't have such a bundle, you can just start at the far left. Now scan right until you encounter the first slash. Now count back two periods, one period, two periods. The material between the first slash and the second period back from it is the domain name. In this case, the trustworthy web page is the one on the top right. I want to look at one more problem that you might encounter when you're trying to read URLs. There are services called URL shorteners that take long URLs and condense them down into shorter ones. TinyURL is an example of a popular URL shortener. It can take a long URL and shorten it down to a much shorter string of letters. These shortened hyperlinks are good for web and mobile messenger apps that limit the length of your messages. But the problem with shortened URLs is that you can't tell where they lead. The domain name of this URL is tinyurl.com. So we do know that tinyurl is going to redirect us somewhere, but we don't know where to. So maybe you think that this message is fishy because maybe your dad doesn't usually use the acronym OMG or because he doesn't usually use exclamation points. How can you investigate this link without clicking on it? Now, let's assume for the moment that for some reason you can't get a response from your dad, so you can't just ask him about it. You can convert shortened URLs into a readable format if you expand them in a URL expander. Longurl.org is an example of a relatively popular URL expander. Just copy and paste the shortened URL into the URL expander and click the expand button. The URL expander will display the full URL and you can find the domain name. In this case, the domain name is from a trusted domain, isualum.org, so we know that it's safe to click on the link. Alright, that's all I have for you on reading URLs. In the next lesson, we'll talk about some of the social threats that we face online. Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 30, Interpersonal Issues Online. So far in this course, we have focused on threats to electronic information. We haven't talked much about social human issues. In this lecture, we'll focus on some of the interpersonal issues that we face online. We could go on practically forever if we tried to identify and discuss every single one of them, so I'm going to limit myself to just five broad topics. Anonymity, 
missing the communication context, privacy, everlasting information, and credibility. I'll define each of these topics in more detail as we go. Interpersonal issue number one is anonymity. People tend to feel anonymous when they're online, and they tend to feel like they're interacting with anonymous electronic strangers rather than flesh and blood peers. This anonymity can be empowering in a way. It allows some shy people to discuss problems or concerns that they may never have discussed otherwise. Sometimes these discussions can be productive or even life-changing. But anonymity clearly has its disadvantages too. For some reason, anonymous people will say terrible, inflammatory things that they would never say in person to somebody who is just standing there. It seems that anonymity empowers our whole selves, both the good and the bad parts of us. Countless online conversations have ground to a halt or deteriorated into angry name-calling because the anonymous participants in the conversation treated each other as faceless strangers rather than respected flesh-and-blood peers. This is a serious problem. Remember that people online are people. As a rule of thumb, you should be more polite online, not less polite. Anonymity is an illusion anyway. Unless you have a high level of computer and networking knowledge, everything you do online can potentially be traced back to you. Your fake login name or your fake email account may make you anonymous to other casual computer users in an online comment thread, but they won't protect you from a high-level hacker or from a full-fledged federal investigation. You would be best served to assume that everything you do online can be traced back to you. Interpersonal issue number two is missing the communication context. The physical context of communication is very important to getting a message across. Facial expressions, gestures, and other body language can have a profound influence on the meaning of any given sentence. So can your tone of voice. Consider the sentence, Why did you leave the party early? It could mean a lot of different things depending on how you read it. Why did you leave the party early? Or, why did you leave the party early? Or, why did you leave the party early? Can you think of other ways that you could deliver that sentence so that it takes on other meanings? The point I'm getting at is that all of those subtle differences in body language and tone of voice that we rely on in face-to-face -face communication, those disappear when we begin to rely on written communication online. Sure, we can use capital letters or emojis to add emotion and emphasis to our writing, but those tools can only go so far. It's incredibly easy to misread somebody's intention in their writing, especially if we ourselves are cranky or suspicious when we're reading their writing. This is probably another reason why so many online discussions deteriorate into name-calling. The participants in the discussion may already disagree on some point, which puts up their guard. Once their guard is up, they tend to read each other's statements in the worst way possible. When you're reading what somebody else has written online, it's a good idea to read it in the best light possible. If you aren't sure how they meant to say something, it's better to ask for clarification, or to just assume the best, than to automatically default to assuming the worst. Interpersonal issue number three is privacy. We have talked about privacy a lot in previous lessons, but the basic ideas bear repeating. Nothing you do online is really private. Now, institutions like banks have a lot of legal and economic motivation to keep your information private, but even powerful institutions like banks can't always safeguard your privacy. Not perfectly, anyway. When you're dealing with regular people, people who don't have legal or economic motivations to guard your privacy, then the situation is much worse. Your friends and family, they have social motivations to guard your privacy. They want to get along with you, and they probably want what's best for you. Social motivations can be incredibly strong, but social motivations can also change quite suddenly. All it takes is one moment of anger or weakness, and a friend could forward your private information to hundreds of people. The best mindset is probably to simply accept that nothing you share electronically is really 100% private. If you have pictures, secrets, or opinions that you want to keep to yourself, then you probably just shouldn't share them electronically. Interpersonal issue number four is everlasting information. 
The internet is made up of millions and millions of computers spread across the entire globe. When something gets published on the internet, it tends to end up on several computers in different locations, and over time, there's really no telling where that file will be copied or where it will end up being saved. For this reason, it's extraordinarily difficult to delete anything that has been published online. Even private files like emails or photos uploaded to social media accounts usually persist in some form on some computer somewhere long after the user decides to delete those files. So be careful about what you upload online because frankly, the internet is forever. Interpersonal issue number five is credibility. 